Dr. Mujumdar, please. Okay. Uh, welcome you all and good uh, good morning everyone and welcome you all. Uh, I, uh, Professor Shishendu Sarkar, on behalf of organizing committee uh, of two days international conference on recent trends in basic and applied sciences jointly organized by Vir Ganguly College and Damda Motijil College. Uh, welcome you all. And we have, we are in day two now and we have a technical session one this time. So I would like to introduce Dr. Somit Mojumdar from Bhairav Ganguly College. He will host this session. And I would request uh, Dr. Somit Mojumdar to start this session. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Shishendu, uh, for giving me this opportunity. Hello and good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Dr. Somit Mojumdar. Today, uh, we are pleased to have Professor Joseph Niguven with us. Professor Niguven is an associate professor of chemistry at Mount Marcy University. He received his PhD degree from the University of Canas with Professor Andy Borovic in analytical and material chemistry. Professor Niguven was then a postdoctoral researcher working with Professor Sheth Cohen at University of California, San Diego with funding from the National Institute of Health Training Grant. His work with Professor Cohen has been highly cited and helped lead the field of post-synthetic modification from basic science to application. Professor Niguen started his position at Mount Mercy University in the year 2010. Hello. Hello. Hello, Dr. Samit Mujumda. Are you here? So, Sarkar, please carry on. Okay. And uh, now I would request Dr. Joseph Nguyen to start his presentation. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, can I share my screen? I will. Okay. Yes, Professor Joseph. Yes. Here we go. Thank you. Thank you very much for the organizers of the committee. Uh, I I am very honored to to be able to speak to your conference. Uh, to talk about the work that we've done on metal organic frameworks and the, the process that we went through using post-synthetic modification of uh, these metal organic frameworks or MOFs to develop functional materials, biomaterials, and nanomaterials. Um, it's a pleasure for me to talk to you about this because uh, this is a, a, a unique area that when I started this work, it was more about the basic science. And so what we hit, what you know, after I started working on this project, we started making these materials to be more functional and have some applications. And so what this, uh, what this talk will mainly focus on is we will talk a little bit about where you can go with this research, but we're gonna focus more on, on the characterizations of these, these uh, materials and why those characterizations have been useful in helping lead this area for, towards the applications of MOFs in this area. I uh, would like to start off by uh, thanking uh, Professor Cohen for allowing me to work on this project, as well as some of my colleagues with uh, Dr. Wang uh, started with this project with Dr. Cohen and where they, they started this with as a proof of concept. Um, I want to thank Dr. Tsnabi and Garibay and Volthringer, who were all colleagues that worked on different types of materials that I utilize and uh, worked on making these materials a little bit more viable. Dr. Sue was our mass spectroscopist. Dr. Choi helped me with some contact angle measurements that you will see later. And Ryan and Michael in the Nano 3 Center 
help train me on the on their uh, electron microscopy uh, and then my funding. And so what I like to start with is talking about these traditional micropores materials. What we know of some of the traditional micropores materials are these inorganic zeolites or activated carbons. These inorganic zeolites are aluminum silicates. Uh, both of these materials have these wonderful absorbent properties. And because they can absorb certain types of compounds and aspects, it's, it's been widely used in industry for separations and catalysis. A little bit of gas storage and capture, you know, there's not, you know, there's an, you know, there was an, a time where that was interesting at one point in time. But again, you know, where its value was, was mainly in catalysis and separations. The problem though, is both of these materials are rather amorphous and makes it really hard to characterize and to kind of understand what's going on there. And so since it's so hard to characterize and amorphous, it makes it very difficult to specialize these materials even more to get, gain access to very more, uh, much more specific catalysis or catalytic reactions. And as such, this is where metal organic frameworks can kind of play a role. These uh, new types of materials are more crystalline and easier to characterize. And because of that, what we can do is we can add some specificity to it. And when we add some specificity and characterization techniques, now we have access to a certain area of, of application, uh, such as medicine, whether it's drug delivery or diagnostics, it's rather valuable in either way. And so what metal organic frameworks or MOFs are, are generally two or 3D crystalline lattices. And what we utilize is we utilize some organic ligand and a metal ion. And what happens here is they form linkages together and they form these nice highly crystalline structures. And what Omar Yagi's group had done is they made a series of these IR MOFs. IR is isoreticular because it's rather symmetrical in nature. And so they had a series of MOFs and what they showed in their study early on is that these new materials had high surface areas and very crystalline and as such, these can be characterized and utilized. And because we can actually identify these better, these materials can be utilized in hybrid aspects of things. It could be utilized in other, um, in other functions and other materials and, and further uh, spe specialized and uh, create some high modularities. And so we, what we can do is we can start looking at very specific types of reactions we want to try to to accomplish or you, uh, use these. And so what happens here is that you have this, this metal cluster and these linkage to make these porous materials that, you, that we can use. And so what ends up happening with these MOS is that if you change the metal ion, as you are probably well aware of, is different ions have different coordination aspects. And so what ends up happening between the metal ion and, and uh, the ligand you can create various types of porosities and shapes of materials. And so these are just two of many types of MOFs that are available. Here on the left, whenever you add chromium, you have this kind of MOF, this what we call mill because of the, where it started with the materials of Institute of Lavoisier. This has some kind of like a breathing type of atmosphere, you know, uh, characteristic. And so in certain conditions, it'll be much more porous and open and others, we can close that out and just try to kind of regulate that. And what you'll see is you'll see where that regulation can be utilized and functionalized. Another moth that I'm gonna be talking about later on is this UMCM from Michigan. So there's a group in Michigan that started this, picking the same type of ion with the zinc and the BDC, which is the benzene dicarboxylate, if we add an additional ligand, BTB, which is a tribenzoate, then we can have a much more porous material than before. And so, and you know, these are just three small examples of these types of MOFs that can be utilized. Where it has been used in research uh, is highly used in gaseous, especially gaseous catalysis. And so you can see here with carbon monoxide catalytic oxidation with coal combustion, it has been used to try to absorb elemental mercury. Another gaseous uh, 
reaction is with the removal of nitrogen oxides. And so again, with CO and nitrogen oxides, these gases, as you're well aware of, are greenhouse gases that we want to try to collect so we can try to protect our atmosphere even better. Furthermore, other areas of coal combustion, and not just coal combustion, but with the nitrogen oxides in industrial sites where these, these factories are churning out and burning, they will be making a lot of these, these pollutants. And so if we could try to capture those, then we can try to kind of clean up the atmosphere better. And here, this moth right over here has been shown to selectively go through some selective oxidation of sulfides. Another area that is, has been used and studied is using um, some volatile organic compounds in catalytic oxidations. And so again, it's one of those things that if we can try to keep them from going into the atmosphere, we can try to keep that and be much, much more sustainable in those processes. Besides catalysis, it has been used in water purification. You know, uh, over in India, what you, you are rather well aware of that I would say, you know, a lot of U.S. citizens are not, is that water is a very scarce resource in most parts of the world. Uh, and, and Americans take it for granted. And so this water purification process, they take for granted that, you know, almost anywhere else is a really important process to think about. And so moths have been looked at as, as, to, uh, as an area of opportunity. And so this moth right here has been used to absorb the organics out of the solution to kind of clean it up some. Uh, not just organics, you could try to use it to absorb high valent metal ion, uh, metal ions, such as arsenate or mercury. What's unique is one of the researchers have been able to put these moths inside membrane cells and use reverse osmosis. Again, a rather unique process and in, in, in application of these moths in water purification. But as I was talking about before, where moths uh, uh, kind of separate themselves from the other microporous materials is that because of the way that you can character, because of the way that you can create these moths that are very specific, then we can go into drug delivery. And so here, even though some zeolites have been used, again, that absorption is just non-specific. We want some specific absorption and release. And so here, this moth, this MIL-53, has been shown to control the release of ibuprofen. If it's open, it will release it. If it's closed, it doesn't absorb any. Right in the middle is where it will trap it and you can kind of control that aspect. Another researcher has been able to utilize this in release of caffeine. Uh, one researcher incorporated some of these moths inside a silica-based nanoparticle to, to release cisplatin very slowly. Again, one of those simple type of studies as far as trying to deliver a cancerous drug. And as you could see, this aspect and the spin towards the nanoparticles where I'll end up my talk is a really neat area of opportunities because with nanoparticles, as you know, these are smaller materials that increase the surface area, makes it much more reactive, made it mainly very appealing as far as its use. We can try to be more efficient with our drug delivery. And so here on this slide, these are just a few examples of some, some research that's out there where we can make some of these crystalline nanomoths and deliver doxorubicin or cisplatin. And gene delivery is another area. So this one researcher, what ends up happening here is that this researcher added cisplatin or you know a different type of prodrug and then added siRNA. So for those of you that don't know what siRNA is, it's more like a silence inhibitor you know, uh, RNA. So it kind of helps kind of block so, the production of, of you know, RNA or DNA for, for, you know, for example, in this coronavirus case, you can try to limit its production by the delivery of this siRNA. Now, while I've showed you many examples that moss have been used, the problem though, is that it still has some limitations. And while these have been great examples of it, one of the biggest limitations to think about is where can it not be used, okay? Before we talk about those limitations, one really unique area 
that when we talk about, especially with your theme, taking this basic science and applying it, if we can make some nanoparticles that have dual properties, we call this theragnostic agents. So the thera part is the therapy. Can we deliver a drug? as well as the Gnostic, which is diagnostic. Can we follow where these nanoparticles are? So in this case, on the left-hand side, these gold nano rods, we can detect those and we can see where it is. And then we can say, okay, this is exactly where the drug is being delivered. Now, if we don't use fluorescence, we can use, you know, excite the nuclear state and use MRI. And so here, MRI is showing you where exactly the drug is being delivered and having that localized delivery of the drug is definitely the target that we want to go with. But again, as I was saying, as, as promising as these materials are, there are still some limitations. Many moths are unstable in air and moisture. Many of the moths that we care about are, are intrigued by, especially the ones that are more porous, are the ones that are unstable. And because if they're unstable, they cannot be crystalline as these uh, electron microscopy images show you. When they're not crystalline, then those pores close and then its applicability goes down. A different area of limitation is even though we can create different types of porous structures, there are many times we actually don't want to use it. So while this mill, this moth right over here has shown control release of the drug, this porous structure is so small that it makes it, it makes it make makes it harder to may be able to use it for very specific drugs, some that are larger that won't fit in there. And so what we could try to do is we want to be able to utilize other moths and capture that drug, deliver it from a localized place, or not just drug delivery, let's talk about catalysis. We want to be able to make sure that the substrates are able to get inside the pores, do the reactivity, and from a heterogeneous perspective, that substrate leaves, and then we can reuse this catalyst. And again, much more of a sustainable process. But if the substrates can't go in for the catalysis, then we are limited in what we can do. And so where this limitation comes has to do with the way that is synthesized. So the traditional approach that these moths have been made is to start off with some starting ligand and then add the functional group of interest. And so what's nice about this Right here, this synthesis is really nice and easy because these are smaller molecules. These are small ligands. It's not like we're trying to synthesize a natural drug, right? Those are 20 steps, 30 steps. Those are a lot of steps. This, these ligands tend to not be that many steps and can be highly done and highly functionalized and gives us a lot of modularities. We can have lots of different functional groups added to the metal ion and then it comes. But this is the problem. The problem is, is that we don't control the kinetics. We don't control the thermodynamics on when these moths or how these moths get made. And so what ends up happening here is that's a huge disadvantage. This process now becomes inefficient because even though we want this functional group, sometimes it doesn't bind the way that we want it. So we have very little control over the moth structure, but more importantly, we have limited control over what functional groups can be used. So for example, having carboxylates. Carboxylates are very useful as, as charged ion species that can interact with DNA, RNA, can, can interact with other metal ions for catalysis. But we can't do that when we're trying to form this moth because carboxylates will always bind to the metal ion. So instead of taking that approach, our group decided to do it this as post-synthetically. So what we do is we're gonna take that starting ligand that has a reactive group, but that reactive group will not in, interact at all with the metal ion. We form the moth that we want, form the moth that has the, the pore shape or the structure or the crystalline lattice that we want. And then because this reactive ligand is going to react with something that's nice and easy, let's say it's an amine. We know that amines can react with isocyanates really readily, right? It can react with acetic and hydrides really readily. And then what we can do now is we can now get the functional groups that we didn't have access to before. And that's why we call this post-synthetic modifications. The advantage again is this is an efficient process. We exactly, we have good control over the moth structure because we can control this step right here. 
And then we have, have more functional groups available. If we want the carboxylates, we absolutely have access to that. And so what we did as, you know, before I joined the group, what my group decided to do is let's look at what was out there. And so what Yogi's group had done had they, uh, as part of their IRMOF series, is they had one with an amine right here. And so they created this MOF, again, the same zinc oxide cluster with the same um, benzene dicarboxylate ligand, but now it has that amino group attached and we can try to utilize that to do some reactions. For the rest of this talk, I'm gonna represent this IRMOF, this crystal structure as kind of this cubic structure even though there are many amines on this cube, we're only gonna show one for simplicity's sakes. And so whenever I use other MOFs, you're gonna find out that it's gonna be, you know, just the bare bones and just gonna show one amine group just for simplicity's sakes here. So what we wanted to do, what they did is they wanted to say proof of principle. We wanna show that we can post-synthetically modify this. And what they did is they took a series of different acid and hydrides and reacted with the amine and notice in these pictures, the crystalline structure stayed the same. So what ends up happening is this, this, uh, this process doesn't change the crystal structure very much. It's still crystalline, which means it's porous. It could be useful. The problem though, whenever you start dealing with materials is trying to characterize solid state materials and trying to characterize it in a way is in its natural state. And so, uh, I'm going to talk about a couple of techniques on what we used to help us characterize this. And then you're going to see that I'm going to talk about a few other strategies later. But the first strategy we use here is going to be the powder X-ray diffraction. What most of you are probably familiar with are single crystal X-ray diffraction, which is, uh, again, with the powder and the single crystal, there's some similar properties here. With the single crystal, you know, what, what the X-ray does is it goes through and it diffracts off based on when it hits the element. And so what the detector does is collects the pattern and then you use your, your computer program to try to discern where all these atoms are. Well, in that same sense, what's gonna happen here is that the X-ray diffracts off that powder and each single crystal structure has different types of cubic lattices. And because they have their unique lattices and shapes and sizes, it will have a different pattern. And so what we can do is we can analyze this rather quickly versus the single crystal approach. This is a really quicker analysis. We can do this with less in less than 30 minutes. If we wanted a good scan, generally only two hours versus trying to go through single crystal diffraction every single time. And so that what ends up happening is you can take the data from the single crystal like IRMOF3, simulate that and compare it to our powder X-ray diffraction and you can see, okay, as long as we have this pa a, a pattern, we know that we haven't changed that MOF structure from where we started. And so now the question though is, even if we haven't changed the MOF structure, how can we be certain that we post-synthetically modified it to what we want? And now, unfortunately, we could have used solid state NMR to, to try to determine this. But again, for ease of analysis and quickness of analysis, we're gonna to have to break this up. And so what my group decided to do was through moth digestion. So we put these crystals in acid, break it up, and then run it on the NMR spectrometer. And as you can tell from the spectrum, what you can see is the labels that we have with the red square are our new ligands. That's been modified in the solid state that we did before. And anything else that is in black is, you know, these black circles show that we have some original sample, uh, some of our original ligands still there, which makes absolute sense because what ends up having to happen is these compounds, these acid and hydrides have to go from the outside to the inside of the crystal. And so what ends up happening is the outside of the, you know, those outside functional groups react more, faster than the ones on the inside. And so what ends up happening is we tend to not get the 100% reaction, but we can get as high as 98 or 99% conversion, which is many times all you necessarily need. And you're going to see here in a little bit that some of those conversions aren't even that high. And so before I joined the group, again, this as proof of concept, what they did is that they showed based on PSM, they have these crystalline structures still, and you can see that we can functionalize these ligands rather well. 
And so uh, what's really unique here is when you look at the longer chains, notice with the longer chains, that conversion wasn't as high, which as I said, you know, they were just kind of showing proof of concept. But as you could tell, if you have 19 extra carbons or 16 extra carbons, there's a couple of reasons why that's going to be. Those are longer. It could be blocking the compound from coming in. But more likely, most, most likely what happens is those carbons are so long that it's really hard for it to kind of stay inside the cavity and do a reaction and, and, and stay put there. On this slide, what you can see is the different types of reactions that can be done, the different functional groups. We talked about how the carboxylates wasn't available before. Now we can make it available. As I said, with isocyanates, you can do that reaction relatively well. What I wanted to do is I wanted to take this concept here and say, can we make this into a material that's useful? And so what I wanted to see is, OK, you know what? We have some of these long chains of carbons or sometimes some of these branch chains of carbons, can we turn this metal organic framework, this moth that is hydrophilic into something that's hydrophobic? And why would I want that? Well, there is some applications here. And so on this video that you're gonna see, you're gonna see that I'm gonna be adding chloroform to this modified moth. And once I add the chloroform to it, notice how much that modified moth is attracted to the chloroform. And there's still a little bit of chloroform at the top. It didn't, couldn't break that surface tension of the water. And on the right, it's just a control. You can see, again, with the way that the organic solvent is, our moth stays right around that. And so one of the potential applications of these hydrophobic moths is, in, for example, cleaning up oil spills. These moths can surround these organic solvents and collect that up, we can kind of clean that up much more readily. But before we do that, we needed to characterize the, the, hydropho uh, the hydrophobic properties of these materials. And one of the ways that I did that was to use what some surface chemists have done, and that's contact angle measurements. What happens here is you add a droplet onto the surface or the material, and then based on the properties between the surface and the water molecule, if there's an interaction because it's hydrophilic, you can see that the water molecule doesn't drop up. It kind of spreads itself out. And as such, when, what happens here is we can kind of measure this angle right here. Anything less than 90 degrees, we would say, you know what, that material or that surface is hydrophilic. But if it has some hydrophobic properties, when you add the droplet, it's going to beat up a little bit more. And notice how this angle widens out right here. So if you can see, that angle widens out. Any angle between 90 degrees and 150 degrees is going to give you something that is hydrophobic. And then we can go even further into su the super hydrophobic mode, which is very important in the electronics industry. And you can see how much wider that angle is. And these are example measurements that I have done on these materials. And one of the things that we wanted to do is just to characterize this. On this image, what you could see is where this kind of idea started for me was when I took these materials, crushed it up, and I added water to IRMOF1. That's the one without the amine. Or IRMOF3, that's the one that has our functional group. When I added water molecules to it, it absorbed immediately. But our modified moth would beat up the water. And I was like, hey, we have something unique here. Let's try to characterize this better. And so as you can see here, it, we needed at least four additional carbons to our amide linkage in order to show this hydrophobic properties. And again, you can see our conversion can be as high as 95, 96, 98% conversions. But you know what, if you don't have uh, you know, as enough carbons on there, it can still be hydrophilic. But what's really interesting is with these three carbons, which like this isopropyl group right over here, we have a 99% conversion because we now have branched it. When you know branching things does increase its hydrophobic properties, again, these materials do that. And so now that we have this, the question then was, well, is there a certain percentage that is required for us to have this hydrophobic properties? Um, one of the things that I do want to point out is notice, you know, whenever we have the longer chains, that 25% conversion, but that is all that was needed 
to in order for us to have a hydrophobic material. What we did here is we could control the amount of reaction that takes place by reaction times. For example, we generally let it sit there for three days. For the 99% conversion, we let it sit for three days. But instead of letting it sit for three days, we let it sit for six hours or 12 hours, kind of varied the conversion. And as you can see, the minimal, the critical percent conversion that's necessary for smaller chains was at least 50%, giving us these hydrophobic properties. Now, the other way to try to characterize the hydrophobic properties or its ability to be stable under ambient conditions is to take the PXRD and see how does my PXRD look? And so as you can see here, we just took the main peak right at the beginning. And with IRMOF1, you can see over a period of four days, after a day, its crystallinity went away. With IRMOF3, you can see over a period of four days that crystallinity continues to decrease. With, a, uh, with the AMID6 version and the AMID15, you can see a little bit of decrease, but I'm gonna show you on this next slide that while there's a percent loss in crystallinity, what you can see is that it does stabilize and keep it uh, more crystalline and helpful from that perspective. Now, before I joined the group, I worked a lot with some nanoparticles and I had some experience with electron microscopy. And I, you know, as much as those nice brown pictures were really cool, I wanted to see it up close and personal. And so I, I suggested like, let's use some electron microscopy and let's look at the surface a little bit more. And so when you look at these images, instead of just letting it sit in ambient air, I just wanted to hit it hard. Let's just add water to it. Let's see what happens. Notice with IRMOF1, even just letting it sit in air, you can kind of see it decompose already starting. It's very unstable from that perspective. And then once we add water to it, notice it goes away. And all of these images on the upper right hand corner, you're going to see the bulk crystal that I took. And then the bigger picture is where I zoomed it in. And so the black line for the smaller box, that shows you how much is 200 micrometers. And this black line down here is 10 micrometers. That helps you understand how well I zoomed into this. And so you can see here with IRMOF3, when I add water to it, you can see the surface starting to break apart. With the AMID6 and the AMID15 version, especially the 15 version, notice that surface hasn't really changed very much. You can see a little bit of change here with the uh, AMID6 version, but nonetheless, the electron microscopy helps visualize how well we've kind of stabilized these, these MOF structures and give it some hydrophobic properties. Now, what was rather interesting is Dr. Volkringer had, had brought this new MOF to the group. And what was interesting about this MIL-53 amine is that it's chemically more robust, but the huge disadvantage is it has smaller pores. Its reactivity might not be as much, but we asked ourselves, can we turn this hydrophilic MOF into something that's hydrophobic? Again, using the same principles. And you know, because these MOFs are a little bit smaller, it's, you know, percent conversion is also going to be smaller. And as you can see on this slide, you know, we couldn't do any, you know, we couldn't do any larger ones beyond, beyond the AMID6. Notice the AMID4 has about a 44% conversion, the AMID6 only. 17, 18%. But nonetheless, we don't need a very high percentage to show that now what we've done is we took a hydrophilic moth and turned it into something that is super hydrophobic. And one of the videos that I'm going to show you after this uh, is, is to show you how that hydrophobic, it's that super hydrophobic property plays, in, uh, plays a role. What I wanted to show you here is the MIL-53 are smaller crystals. Trying to take a picture of it using the camera that we had before, you couldn't really tell that the crystal structure does not change after our post-synthetic modification. You can see, again, these crystals don't change with the post-synthetic modification. On this video, what you're gonna see me do here is you're gonna see water being added. And notice how quickly it rolls off. It doesn't even want to bead very well. Okay, and these images right here that I offer you are just a couple of sample 
uh, recordings when we were taking the measurement. Sometimes the computer couldn't even read how far away it was. That's how, that's how hydrophobic it was. Now, while I just showed you that we just modified these with just one functional group, for catalysis and sometimes drug delivery, you want to have more than one functional group there. And so what Dr. Garibay had done is he was able to show that we can modify and add up to four different uh, functional groups by just kind of controlling that reaction. And so um, where I wanted to take this work is I wanted to take it more towards the biology, not the biology side. I wanted to take it towards the medicine side of things. And when I, during my graduate work, I was really interested in nitric oxide and the delivery of nitric oxide because nitric oxide is an important biomolecule that has very many roles in the body. It acts as a vasodilator as well as a neurotransmitter. It's been known to uh, play a role in apoptosis or programmed cell death. And that's the function that I wanted to utilize as an antimicrobial agent. And I was really interested in that aspect of that. And so when I looked into the literature, what, there was one moth that was trying to uh, release nitric oxide. Now this moth is called H. Cus, mainly because it was originating out of the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. What happens with this moth is that it had metal ions that has an open coordination site. And as we know, some of the, you know, if you go into organic, inorganic chemistry, some of those open sites, nitric oxide will bind. And so what they did here is with H cus with both cobalt and nickel, they found that NO gladly coordinates and then it does release. And so now, and so they kind of showed that, that they had this release of NO. The problem though, with this process and this approach is that you can't control that release of nitric oxide. And anytime we want to try to use something from a drug delivery perspective, we want to be able to control that. One way that we could try to control it is to maybe take an amine, all right? Take an amine, react with some nitric oxide, and make something called a diazanium dilate or NONOate. Now, what's really neat about this is that we can control the release of NO by modifying these different two different R groups. You have different R groups. It has different properties, and then now we can actually control the release of NO however we want it. While I was working on my project to, to release NO, another group, the Resistance Key group, had also worked on it at the same time. What they did, though, is they took the same H cusp that was before. Instead of using cobalt or nickel, they used copper in this case. And what they did here is that they use a pyridine. Okay, and so this four map that they use had an amine uh, group and they exposed it to nitric oxide, converted that amine to NO. And what they did here is you can find out whether or not you form the NONO8 using IR. And so that's where some of these stretching frequencies show up and that lets you know, yep, we actually have that. Now they didn't do any release studies like the previous group did, but what they did say, which makes it a huge disadvantage, is again, this pyridine right here, this format is coordinated to copper, which means that you don't have controlled release as well as you also have leaching. If you leach this, then it makes it that, that reliability of release of NO less. And so instead, I wanted to post-synthetically modify this directly onto the amine that we had into our MOFs. And so the two ones, two of them that I wanted to focus on are IMOF3 and this UMCM. Expose it to nitric oxide at room temperature, and we have these NONOates. Now, the problem with this process is we can't use NMR to try to characterize this. Again, because if you dissolve it in acid, you break it apart, you don't see it. Now, one of the things that I wanted to show you here is that when you modify it, you can see the crystalline structure still stays the same. What was rather unique is that these crystals actually became darker when the NONO8 was made. Now, what the other group didn't use that we were able to use is using electronic spectroscopy to help us out. So again, the amines would actually have, you know, lack in absorption in a certain region at 300 nanometers. So notice on our BDC ligand and our RMOF3, it wouldn't absorb the light or the energy at 300 
nanometers. But whenever it became the NON08, you can see that that absorption actually increases because of the presence of the NO. Now on the UMCM, it's really hard to see the electronic spectroscopy here because again, you don't have as many amine groups in there. And so it's really hard to kind of decipher. It's kind of like a, a detection limit issue. And so when we did the IR on it, you can see with the UMCM that this small blip right here, as well as some of these other ones show you the presence and the formation of the NONO8. And of course you can see the larger stretching frequencies for the IR MOF. And then again, you know, the ligand is just showing you the control that is actually reactive. Now there's one more characterization that we did that made it even much more fully characterized than the, our, you know, than the previous groups is that we can use thermographic analysis. And one of the things about using TGA on solid state materials is what you're doing is you're heating up the material. And as you heat it up, you can break down the compounds. And as it starts losing weight, you can kind of understand what is part of that material. Because when you lose certain percentages at certain temperatures, you can be like, you know what? This functional group isn't as strong. This is why we lose it at this temperature versus this temperature versus this temperature. Now, as you can see with IRMOF3 and UMCM1 amine, you can see that we lose solvent. And then our next big drop is because of our linker starting to decompose. But whenever we have the NONO8, notice we have this little blip right here that means we have additional weight from our NONO8. Lastly, what I wanted to show you here for the NO release is notice with IRMOF3, the NONO8, and UMTM1, NONO8, those release nitric oxides. And so some of these other controls like IRMOF3 and UMCM1 amine, it doesn't release any. What did we do here? We use what's called the Grice analysis. And so what we did is we dissolved this in water, converted the NO to nitrite, and then added the Grice, react, uh, Grice reagents to turn it pink. And then we can use UV vis spectroscopy to determine that. And so what I wanted to show you too is notice IRMOF1 and UMCM1 doesn't have the amine group. So what we did is we exposed it to nitric oxide to see whether or not it would just adsorb NO and hold on to it. And in neither case, NO would not stay because they're porous enough that it would leach back out before the analysis. And so what we're showing you here is that any NO that's released is because of the post-synthetic modification that we did to this material. Where I like to end my talk is talking about some future opportunities of PSM. And so some of my work towards it and just kind of uh, uh, tips and advice on, on thinking about where can this be applied. What, what I had kind of referred to earlier is trying to talk about trying to get some of these nanomoths and then do some post-synthetic modification. Get some of these smaller nanoparticles, make it very favorable, do some post-synthetic modification. Now you can functionalize it even more. If we don't go the nano route, what we can do is because detection and just kind of analysis is so important, what if we modify some of these moths with some kind of fluorescent material? and then use fluorescence to determine um, what happens you know, to our material. And in catalysis, that could be very useful from you know, uh, uh, kind of following a reaction times. And lastly, any kind of a fluorescent material that gets made, most of the time they use a fluorescent metal ion for that purpose. And so let's talk about a little bit of the work that I did in this area and kind of my tips to try, kind of show you. What I saw in a uh, Maisel's group had found out that if you use a microwave synthesizer and you use some high, you know, high pressure, high uh, and, and high energy just to kind of zap it, what you could do is you can create these micron sized moths and use that. And so what they had done quite nicely is they found, hey, you know what, if we decrease the concentration, what they started doing is they started losing a little bit of crystallinity, but the size stayed the same. What I found interesting is with their IRMOF3, they don't show a close-up image. And I'm kind of curious why they didn't show that. But you're going to see with my work, I'm kind of curious whether or not they actually had something crystalline. And so what I thought was maybe if I took the process, even diluted it down further, maybe hit it with some different wattage, can I create some of these nanomoths versus micron moths? And unfortunately, 
you know, I didn't have enough time to play with this, but you can see I can replicate what they did. I actually had to find the reaction time had to go for, you know, go longer than normal. But in, in none of the case with IRM off one, I was able to get something that was crystalline with IRM off three, where I kind of thought it was interesting is notice when I only did it for 90 seconds, I have these spheres, which aren't crystalline at all. I started getting some, some crystalline properties. These are more micron size. But when I tried to dry it and try to characterize it using PX3D, again, I wasn't getting some crystalline properties. So that was rather unique. But what I want to talk about next is some other ways that other groups have tried to make some nanoparticles. One group took IRMOF3, and instead of using a microwave uh, synthesizer, they did it still at 100 degrees Celsius like we normally did with our normal crystals, but they did this in a par bomb. So they increase the pressure really high. And with the increased pressure, what ends up happening most likely is that those nucleation sites now are not as favorable. And so now what ends up happening is you have these small crystals that grow all over the place, but they don't grow on top of each other. And what they did further, and notice they have some crystalline properties. This is still, you know, this was better than what I was getting in some cases but they still have some crystalline properties. And what they did is they use post-synthetic modification to add folate and then add the drug. And so they can kind of follow that. One of the more interesting papers that I saw was being able to make these nanomoths using microfluidics. Can you flow this at certain pressures and a certain flow rate, certain temperatures to make these moths? And they were able to do it. And they actually went one step further and did some post-synthetic modification as they were making and synthesizing these moths. And these moths definitely had a lot more crystallinity than the previous studies. So talking about fluorescent moths, what I did is, you know, we, we, we had easy access to naphthalene and hydride. And so we, you know, we said, hey, what if we took our IR moth 3 reacted with, uh, you know, naphthalene and hydride, what happens? Well, as you can tell, naphthalene is rather large compared to the porous size. And so this conversion was about 17%. But when I took it to the fluorescent microscope, you can see, you know what, the ligand is slightly fluorescent under these conditions, but our modified moth is even more so. And so because this conversion was so small, I decided let's try it on UMCM, even though there's fewer amine groups that's more porous. And so what ends up happening here is you can see my conversion actually jumped up to 90%. And whenever you took it to the fluorescent microscope, you could see under the exact same conditions, this modified UMCM with the naphthalene group is more fluorescent. One of the things that Dr. Garibay did is he tried to modify it with fluorescein. Now, fluorescein and hydride is not readily available. So he had to try to synthesize that. Unfortunately, he couldn't ever do it cleanly, but I was glad what he tried to do is, you know what? I'm gonna take the crude mixture, react it, and let's see what happens. And what's really cool about the wavelength that we needed to use to excite the fluorine, fluorescein here is that you would actually don't see the IRMOF3 at all. It doesn't fluoresce at that energy. And then lastly, I wanted to try to utilize these IRMOFs, uh, try to use the microwave synthesizer to form nanoparticles and see whether or not these are going to be fluorescent, which they are. I just wasn't given enough time to try to properly study this. But, uh, you know, as you can see, there are some unique aspects here and approaches that we can go with. And so what I wanted to, just to end with is to show you and talk about how we were able to create and synthesize moths that have some desirable chemical and physical properties. I was able to show you that this was the first comprehensive study of stabilizing some of these moisture sensitive moths and to create some of these two, uh, some new NONO8 functionalized moths. And then we also talked about the ability to maybe make some of these nanomoths, and this could be some promising new areas. Nanomoths are being made right now, but they're being incorporated into other materials. Not the most efficient process, it's effective right now, but if you can try to make that more efficient by actually doing post-synthetic modification on the moths themselves, you can actually have a better process from the big scale perspective. And so with that, um, I would be glad to take any questions, but I would, again, I want to thank the organizers of this, uh, of this conference. Uh, it's been my honor and my pleasure to present my research to you. And again, I would be glad to take any questions that you might have.
okay uh, now the question session is open we already have one question so so uh, okay professor joseph can we take questions yeah absolutely okay uh, one question uh, from ishita chatterjee uh, she uh, she want to know we know that a cotton cloth absorbs water drop which shows hydrophilic property but when water droplets fall on cotton bed cover the droplets are not absorbed instantly before absorption they float on cover surface that is it shows a hydrophobic property why does it happen that's a great question and it has to do with the way that those sheets are woven into place and so what ends up happening there is that it shows some hydrophobic properties but what ends up happening is is that the cotton is separated enough that it doesn't allow that water to interact straight across the board and so what you what what the what the bed sheet doesn't do is it doesn't break the surface tension of that water bead and so that water stays beaded up until after a little bit and then you can kind of see it kind of reabsorb and so there's a couple of effects there because you have to overcome the, the its own hydrogen bonding it, itself in order for it to kind of spread great question okay uh, uh, there is a question from my side uh, professor joseph uh, you have shown that uh, there are so many moths uh, that have less than 90% conversion right uh, yes. so uh, there is a possibility that some other compounds are forming so what is the method of purification of this moth so you know it's so it's not that other compounds are forming it's just that you the original ligand isn't changing okay and so when when we try to purify it you have a you asked an excellent question and what makes the solid state chemistry really hard is that our purification process isn't uh, there's not really much of a purification process is just kind of like trying to understand how much gets converted because that then can tell us can that be an effective catalytic tool if the conversion is 44%, that might not be the best material to use because you don't have enough sites in there for the reaction to occur, right? Does that make sense? And so th there's that control that we have to kind of play around with. Absolutely. Fantastic question. Dr. Joseph, uh, please close your presentation first. I'm please sorry? Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, now it's okay. We are okay. viewing more uh, brightly you now. Uh, actually, single crystal and uh, NMR study is completely different. Single crystal is not the bulk property uh, measuring technique, right? And NMR, you are measuring the bulk property. So, if in the single crystal some input is there, you cannot detect. But in NMR, if there yeah. is input, you can easily detect, right? Correct. You, you are absolutely right. What we try to do is we try to make sure that we rinse it out enough to try to make sure that we don't have any additional compounds still absorbent in there, which I will tell you when you don't clean it well enough, we have found in our, in that bulk property, we have found the impurities, but most of the time it's just because it's lingering. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Yeah, because uh, I'm doing also this research uh, with uh, single crystal and NMR. So uh, when I found that uh, your conversion rate is less than 90%, so I have doubt that uh, how you uh, purified that amount. You know, so that's a, that's a fantastic question. Um, you know, I, I will tell you that there's a good chance that that moth might not be as pure or as crystalline as we would like overall. I, I, I would say that I, I think you're spot on, that it might not be exactly the same, but, but it's more crystalline or at least we can characterize it better than in some other materials though. But you, you are absolutely right. Thank you, Professor Joseph, for your nice presentation. So I am not in this field, but uh, maybe a layman's question. Uh, how, how can the criteria of internal and external mass and heat transfer be applied on flex flexible moths? So, so ask your question one more time. How can the criteria of internal and external mass and the heat transfer be applied on flexible moths? 
You know, I, I think that's a great question. Um, there have been a couple studies where they have, what they tried to do is they tried to change that transformation to see whether or not you can try to do some charge transfer studies or, or interaction studies. And so, um, you know, those, those are, are rather unique uh, uh, studies. And so um, I, I don't follow those moths as well, but, but there's a possibility of that. We tried to do that a little bit, but I don't think we ever were as successful uh, while I was part of the group. And so it's, I would say that you, you have a great question that there's a possibility to try to study it, but um, I think it, the, the tr to try to control that, um, you have to have the right conditions though, unfortunately. And how, how will the drying process affect the morph crystallinity and particle size? So for the most part, the drying process tends to uh, keep its crystallinity fairly high, not as high as it was in the solution state. But for the chemically uh, stable ones, not so bad. Uh, you can see with our MOF1, it really does affect it. But with my, our hydrophobic MOFs, it didn't at all. It actually um, it didn't affect it too much. But uh, you know, anything that is hydrophilic, drying it definitely uh, hurt it more. OK, uh, Dr. Jhumpa Mukherjee is asking, uh, have you tried to use the MOF synthesized by you for NO release in biological samples? <laughs> Fantastic question. I have personally not. Uh, I would have loved to do that. But by the time that uh, my work was done, um, I got my, my job at the institution that I was at that didn't give me the capabilities to do those studies um, early on. And so um, that's something that I would love to go back to now that we have more capabilities. But absolutely would love to try to do that sometime. Okay, uh, another question from uh, Dr. Indunil Boshak. Uh, he want to ask you so many questions actually. I'm telling one question. If uh, the MOF have the capability to become ideal media to deliver drug, especially with the fluorescent tag, fluorescent tag attached, have they been tested to enter a cell? Yes, they have been tested to enter um, most of the cells that they've tested are HeLa cells, not anything that cross crosses that blood brain barrier as much. But, you know, as far as proof of concept, most of the cells that I've seen are mainly HeLa cells. They haven't gone past that. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it was literally a great presentation. Uh, my question is coming from the fact that, um, you know, like it's always tough to cross the blood brain barrier. And has it been tested like to do, um, does it, or in, in vivo system, or um, do you think it has the, or these moths have the potential to cross the blood brain barrier? I do. I do think it has the potential. And, and why I say that is what's really neat about that is that you can modify it with the right tag in order for it to get, get to the receptor on that blood brain barrier and get it to interact with it just right. And then it can do that. And so having that control is really nice. And so what you can do here is you can absorb the drug separately and interact and post-synthetically modify it with the right receptor agents that is necessary to cross that. And I think that's, uh, uh, you know, I, I've seen that done a lot with um, silica-based nanoparticles. Again, with silica-based nanoparticles, you have an amorphous structure. And so I would be more, excited to see that uh, in something that is uh, something that you can control better. Cool. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, because of shortage of time, we cannot take uh, any other question. Uh, once again, thank you, Professor Joseph, uh, for delivering and enlightening us with your lecture. And thank you on behalf of this organizing committee. Again, I thank you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much for having me. Uh... Thank you, Dr. Joseph Newgan, to deliver a wonderful lecture of his work. It was nice and quite impressive. And thanks, Dr. Samit Mojumdar, to host this session. Uh, before going to start next talk, I have an announcement to all participants. 
feedback form will be sent to you via mail after validatory session we have already sent a mail to all participants containing bgc library link yesterday night register yourself first to download participation certificate of this conference after filling up feedback form and a different link will be sent to the paper presenters for downloading presentation certificates by tomorrow now i would like to proceed uh, to next talk which will be delivered by dr indranil bosak from department of chemistry university of otago new zealand his lecture on a very interesting topic brain disease where does the future leads us i would request dr sanjit kumar das to welcome dr indranil bosak and introduce him to the audience Thanks, Yuchendu. Uh, good morning, and welcome to this uh, invited lecture number five of two days international conference on recent trends in basic and applied science, jointly organized by the Department of Physics, Bhairavongli College, and Gamna uh, Motijil College. Uh, in this session, it's my privilege and honor to welcome our invited speaker, Dr. Indranil Bosak, postdoctoral fellow, Department of Biochemistry, University of Otago, New Zealand. Let me introduce our honorable speaker. Uh, Dr. Indranil Bosak is from Durgapur, West Bengal. He has completed bachelor degree in pharmacy from the University of Technology, Kolkata, and MSc in pharmacology from Glasgow Caledonian University, UK, in 2009. He has been awarded PhD from St. John's University, New York, USA, in 2016, and did his postdoc from University of Utah, USA, in 2018. Uh, Dr. Bosak is presently attached as postdoctoral fellow, University of Otago, Dunanik, New Zealand. His research areas are mutation in lysosomal genes in neurons leads to a childhood brain disease. Parkinson's disease uh, revealed novel protein forms in disease uh, brain and non-coding RNA biomakers in disease serum, role of non-coding RNA in platelet function and production, generation of human neurons for induced pluripotent stem cells and different areas of biotechnology issues. Uh, Dr. Bhashak has completed a number of research projects funded by several renowned academic bodies of UK, USA, and New Zealand. He has been awarded uh, Dr. Daniel Lilly Scholarship from St. John's University, New York, 2012, Excellence in Research Award for the same university in 2016, American Society of Hematology Abstract Achievement Award, USA, 2017, and Neurological Foundation of New Zealand in 2019. Uh, Dr. Bashak has published his research work in several reputed journals around the world with a very high impact factor. And uh, it's nice to mention that Dr. Bashak is associated with various uh, social work also. Uh, Dr. Bashak, the span is one hour, so I request you to kindly finish it off by 11.50 so that uh, 10 minutes uh, may be used for our question and answer session. Uh, so I request uh, Dr. Bashak to deliver his lecture on brain disease uh, for the future leads us. Dr. Basak, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Das, and thanks to the organizers for um, allowing me to um, share my research. I, I have not put too much details about like all the technicalities that we have been using in our lab, but I'll give you an overview of what um, we are, what I have been doing and what um, we are doing in our lab currently. So I'm going to share my screen and please let me know if you do not um, get to see my screen. Is everything okay? It's fine, it's okay. fine. Good. Thank you. Right, so, right. As Dr. Das mentioned that I'm a postdoctoral fellow um, in uh, the Neurodegenerative and Lysosomal Disease Laboratory. I work with Associate Professor Stephanie Hughes and um, we are at Otago, um, University of Otago in Dunedin in New Zealand. But before jumping into um, the main um, research area, I would like to uh, give you a brief background um, about like where I come from and um, what has been my journey. So um, I am, as um, Dr. Das said, like I'm from Durgapur, it's still one of my favorite cities on this planet. And um, after finishing my under, um, undergrad from um, Asansol, I moved to Kolkata, so I do know Bharagangli College. I used to go for walks and I used to go for runs in the beautiful ground of Bharagangli College. Um, and um, I did a job in uh, Goria um, uh, 
where it was basically a pharmaceutical company after finishing my undergrad. Um, but what always have been um, interested me is research um, and research with DNAs and RNAs and protein. And I didn't have much of an idea like what I'm going to do, of course, once when I was um, uh, when I was finishing off my um, undergrad. Um, and that's when um, that's why I joined this job. But while doing all doing the job in Goria, um, I got to realize that, yes, I need to know more and more about mechanisms, like how medicines work in our body. And that kind of um, compelled me to um, start my master's degree in pharmacology. And that's when I moved from Durgapur via Kolkata to Glasgow in um, the UK. So I did a bit of um, studies in uh, a small tiny molecule called microRNA. Uh, these are like tiny RNA molecules floating around in the blood. And I did a job um, after my master's in Glasgow as well, uh, which gave me some good research experience, some ideas to uh, move forward with my future plans of research. So after doing that job, I moved to New York uh, for my PhD. Um, my PhD was on Parkinson's disease. It's a brain disease and I'll talk about that even more in the next few slides. And um, after doing my, uh, after finishing my um, PhD, I moved to Philadelphia for a postdoc. The entire lab in Philadelphia um, decided to move to a city called Salt Lake City um, uh, in Utah. And that's where I kept on going with my postdoctoral research. Um, while I was doing all these, um, um, like I was, hang on a minute, just a minute. I'll put this one on. Okay, while I was traveling around the US, my wife uh, started her uh, postgraduate studies in New Zealand. And um, I visited New Zealand in 2017, found it to be a pretty cool place. So I decided to move to New Zealand and start and keep doing my um, um, brain research. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the human brain and I wanted to show you something um, more interesting about the human brain. Um, so this is an image, this is a picture of different brains, like the human brain, the chimpanzee, baboon, dog, cat, etc., etc. And as you can see from this image, that the human brain is the largest one, and it looks like most complicated among all of these brains, right? And it is true, the human brain is one of the most complicated organs of our body. Look, look at these folds that you can see. So these folds are basically all the cells folded together because it, it requires so much, there is so many number of cells. There are billions and billions of cells in our uh, human brain, but that needs to be compacted, that needs to be folded only into a small size skull that we have, right? So that's why it needed to be folded in so many folds. Um, so this, our brain consists of several kinds of cells, but the, some of the most important cells, like for example, one cell is called a neuron. So what these neurons are, basically they're called the unit of the brain. So they regulate all the activities that we do, like talking, speaking, talking, listening, um, seeing, eating, all the activities that we do are controlled by these neurons. Now, there are two more types of cells, these star-shaped cells called the microglia, as well as the astrocytes. Now, until recently, or at least till the last decade, um, they were called the supportive cells of the brain. So they were known to support these neurons. But until recently, in the last four or five years, um, they have been shown to have even more function than just a supportive function. They actually regulate the neuronal function. So they regulate when the neurons can fire a stimulation, when the neurons can fire an electrical impulse, when the neurons can talk to another neurons or receive another message from another neuron. So in combination with the astrocyte and the microglia, the neurons um, kind of are the drivers of our activities, but these two cell types also uh, play an equally important role in contributing towards all the activities that we do. Now, if you look into the brain, of course, our brain is not that colorful. It's mostly pink in color. And um, the reason this brain has been colored is to highlight that 
there are different regions of our brain which um, suffer from specific diseases. Like for example, this is the front part and it's called a, a disease called a frontotemporal, uh, frontotemporal dementia is, a, is, is caused in this region of the brain. Then there is this midbrain part where uh, there is a disease called Parkinson's disease occur. And then there is this cortical part uh, where Alzheimer's diseases, um, um, uh, Alzheimer's disease um, happen. So um, in the same brain environment, as you can see, there are certain regions in the brain which are affected. However, there are certain regions of the brain which are also not affected. So that means that certain regions of the brain are vulnerable or they are susceptible to certain diseases well, while other regions of the brain are like pretty protective from those kind of diseases. So one of my researches, and we recently got funded for um, uh, doing this research to um, see why the new, why some cells in the brain are protected against a particular disease while other cells do not or are not protected. So the ones, if we can, if we can harness the protective mechanism of the cells that are living, then we can apply that formula, that protective formula onto the ones that are dying and we will try to save them. So that's one of the ideas that we have forward. Now, the problem with the brain cells, drawbacks of the brain cells is like their inability to regenerate. So when I say regenerate, it means like, suppose you have a cut or a wound on your hand and what happens after seven days? The wound or the cut heals, right? The problem with the brain is these neurons, the neurons that I was talking about, when they die, they do not come back. So it's hard to regenerate those neurons. So for example, in this top image that you are seeing, the left-hand side is how a cross-section of a healthy brain looks like. Whereas on the right-hand side, you can see there is, this is an aged brain, like a person who is aging or aged. So the difference is there are a few gaps like this gap right, which is missing in a healthy brain, but it's present in an aged brain. And this is nothing but um, loss of cells or loss of neurons. So as I said, the neurons once lost, they cannot be retrieved. So that's why once they are lost, um, you can't really replace them with good neurons. Now, if you compare this aged brain section with a brain section from an, a patient with Alzheimer's disease, you'll see the gaps increase massively. This means like there is massive cell death in, these, um, in this particular brain in, from a person who is suffering from Alzheimer's disease. And if you compare with the aging, aging or the aged brain, it's even more severe. So that kind of says that these cells are not coming back, they do not come back and the loss is like permanent. And that kind of like is um, the problem with our brain that is, Again, the cells do not come back. Same with the Parkinson's disease. There is a particular region of the brain, which is called the midbrain. And in this midbrain, there is this patch of cells that you can see in the healthy brain, but this patch is either missing or is diminished in Parkinson's disease. So that's the problem. Again, these cells do not come back once they are dead. Now, how to solve this problem? So in order to solve this problem, um, People or researchers have been trying different strategies to uh, save the dying neurons or um, to replenish the dead neurons. And one of the techniques that have um, caught the attention of um, researchers for the last two decades is called stem cells. And it has been in the news for the last two um, decades. You probably have heard about stem cell replacement therapy uh, in the news. And um, it has been, as I mentioned, it has been um, discussed in different brain diseases like stroke, uh, Parkinson's disease, in case of brain damage, to repair brain damage, et cetera, et cetera. But what are these stem cells? So let me just give you a brief background about the stem cells. Now in our body, um, we've got two types of stem cells. One is the embryonic stem cells, which we, the adults, don't have. So embryonic stem cells, the, the term suggests that it's coming from the embryo. Um, the cool fact about the embryonic stem cell is, um, firstly, they can self-renew, so they can keep generating themselves, as well as they can give rise to any, any type of cell you want. 
So that's how an adult human is made from an embryonic stem cell. So these embryonic stem cells can give rise to liver, kidney, um, eyes and hair and brain and heart and anything you want. But when we grow up, we lose the embryonic stem cells. So when we grow up, we have another type of stem cell, which is called the adult stem cells. And these adult stem cells, they also can self renew, but they have one limitation. They can only make a particular type of cell type cells in our body. For example, there are neural stem cells and these neural stem cells can only make neurons or the cells in the brain. They cannot make any of the heart cells. They cannot make any of the um, kidney cells or the liver cells. So now the scientists were kind of like enticed by both the ideas. And, um, but the problem was um, um, how to combine both of this because it's pretty lucrative to use the embryonic stem cells. Whereas we, are, we, we can't use embryonic stem cells that much because of all the ethical issues. And you, you don't have like um, um, an unlimited source of embryonic stem cells. But we are kind of stuck with the adult stem cells um, because um, these are the only ones that are available. But the limitation is, again, we cannot make anything as we can make from embryonic stem cells. So while the scientists were kind of like um, juggling between these two stem cells, um, in the early 2000s, um, uh, two scientists, jo Dr. John B. Gordon Gordon and Dr. Shinya Yamanaka, came up with an excellent groundbreaking Nobel Prize winning um, technology called induced pluripotent stem cells. So what they did was, they literally took skin cells from human beings and they added like four transcription factors or reprogramming factors and they made induced pluripotent stem cells. So this is a third type of stem cell that I'm talking about today. Now these induced pluripotent stem cells, they sit right between the embryonic stem cell and the adult stem cell. How? Because these induced pluripotent stem cells, you don't need any, like you don't need to get ethical approval to make these induced pluripotent stem cells. So that takes away that ethical part. The other cool part is you can make any kind of cells, any type of cells. You can make your brain cells, you can make your kidney, liver, heart, whatever you want, muscles from these um, induced pluripotent cells, stem, stem cells. So that increases the potential of these, um, of these kind of cells um, in every kind of research that is happening in uh, biology. So um, just to summarize, like what can we do with these induced pluripotent stem cells? And I, as I was mentioning that you can make the brain cells, you can make um, the heart cells and you can make the liver cells. So what can we do with these cells? Now, um, researchers have been using animal models like rat, mice, rabbit, guinea pig, um, to um, do their researches to find out drugs to cure um, uh, different diseases. But these studies are expensive, whereas induced pluripotent stem cells are not that expensive. So the first thing that, the first application that these induced pluripotent stem cells uh, derived um, different kinds of cells finds the application in is to look at cellular studies. So these models are called in vitro models. And what we can do is to we can understand how proteins work in a cell. When there is a disease, what happens to that protein? When there is no disease, what happens to that protein? And then we can compare. And once we compare, we get to know like what we should do to rectify that disease by just manipulating that protein. So that's the first application. The second application is we can use in vivo model, which is like um, which are basically whole animal models like rat, mice, rabbit, guinea pig, um, chimpanzee, um, sheep, and donkeys. Um, so these models, what we can do is we can initiate a disease such as um, Parkinson's disease, say. So in Parkinson's disease, there are certain cell types in the brain which die. So what we can do is in these mice models or in these rat models, in these in vivo models, whole animal models, what we can do is we can take out the defective cells and we can make these say neurons from these IPS or the induced pluripotent stem cells and replace those defective cells with these freshly prepared healthy neurons. And that way we can actually treat the disease. So that's the second application of these stem cells. The third application is for drug screening. Now, 
say a chemist comes to me and uh, say like, hey, I've made like 50 different compounds, um, 50 different vari variants of a compound um, or a drug. And I think um, some of them will work better than the original compound. And um, I will be like, okay, maybe you have to test it in animals because that's the closest form because that's a whole animal. You have to test it um, in animals because you can't really give that all the 50 drugs to humans because it, it would not pass any approval. You need to go through clinical trials. So it's a lot of work. So instead of that, you have to go through animals. But again, it comes down to 50 drugs being uh, tested with like different concentrations, different dose, different time. So that takes a lot of animal work and it becomes expensive. So that's when these induced pluripotent stem cell derived cells actually come handy. So you can have these cells, for example, you can grow the neurons on basically a piece of plastic dish and you can test your compounds on this dish whether the cells like it, whether the cells don't like it. You can look at exact mechanisms that you are trying to um, um, understand whether the cells uh, survive, whether the cells do not survive, whether the cells can handle a mutation in a gene, whether the cells cannot do that uh, in presence and absence of these drugs. So now that you, you can test all these 50 drugs on your uh, induced pluripotent stem cell derived neurons, that brings you that brings the list from 50 to say five, because you have rejected the 45 because those 45 perhaps have killed your cells. Now that you have five compounds, so you have narrowed down your number of compounds and now you can use those compounds in animal models. So that decreases the use of animal models that decreases the ethical approval uh, constraint that decreases the cost of your research as well. And um, once those animal studies are done, then you can interpret that data and translate that data into human clinical trials. So these are the three main applications of these uh, induced pluripotent stem cell derived um, uh, different cell types. So how the stem cell journey started for me, um, it all started when I was doing my PhD. Um, this is basically St. John's University in New York, and uh, this used to be my group. This is my um, PhD supervisor, uh, Professor Simon Moller. And I was using, I was very fortunate that I got hand to um, some samples, not some, actually more than 300 samples, 300 patient samples, blood samples from Parkinson's disease. Now these samples were not coming from the United States. They were coming from um, our connection, our collaborator back in Norway. Now, one fine morning, I was doing some experiments and I ran out of samples and I went to Simon's office and said like, hey, Simon, I need some more samples. And Simon was like, Indranil, these are Parkinson's disease samples. You don't get them every day. You don't get them in liters. You get only a few microliters. So that kind of started make me think that um, what can we do to avoid this limitation, to get away from this limitation? And that's around, um, it, it, it was around that time that I got to know another professor from um, Sloan Kettering in, in Institute in Manhattan in New York, um, Dr. Lawrence Tudor, who was using human induced pluripotent stem cells in cell therapy. So what he was doing was he was, um, he was creating, he was generating some uh, mouse and rat models of Parkinson's disease. And he was replacing the defective cells or the defective neurons from the brain. And he was replacing them with uh, pluripotent stem cell derived healthy neurons. And it was, his data was um, kind of showing that it improved um, the conditions, it improved the symptoms. It did not cure the disease, of course, but it treated the disease well. So I came back to the lab and asked Simon, hey, Simon, can we do this? And he was very excited about this idea. And we applied for a funding and we got that funding. And um, we were like, okay, fair enough, we got the funding, but I was coming to the final year of my PhD and I was like, you know what, Simon, I, I can't do this because it's a whole new volume. I've never done it before. So it will take more time. And um, Simon was happy for me living, but again, we wanted to do this. We never could do this. So to continue my search for stem cell related questions, I joined um, the Philadelphia lab at, at Thomas Jefferson University to learn more and more about stem cells. But uh, what got more interesting was when I moved to Dunedin. So this is our University of Otago uh, clock tower. And this is my current group um, in Associate Professor Stephanie Hughes. This is Steph. 
um, and we work on stem cells, which have been derived from human skin cells, and we make brain cells. So what happened was um, these cells were not directly derived by us. So Dr. Michael Ward at the National Institute of Health um, in um, the United States at Bethesda, um, he developed this system where he turned the induced pluripotent stem cells, which were again taken from skin cells into brain cells or the neurons. And what Steph did, my current supervisor did, was she brought this technology um, to the University of Otago. And when she brought this universe, uh, brought this technology, that's when I joined her lab and um, I started working with her and started working with these induced pluripotent stem cell derived neurons. So it's a very fun um, um, technique and I will talk about that in the next few slides. Um, so what we study in our lab is, as I said, it's a neurodegenerative and lysosomal disorder um, lab. Um, we have a group of people in our lab, PhD students and uh, postdoctoral fellows who work on Alzheimer's disease. Um, this, um, and then I, with my previous experience in Parkinson's disease, I have also, I'm have i starting to work on a Parkinson's disease project. Um, we just recently got funded for that. And there is another disease which you might not have heard about. It's called Batten disease. Now, a few words about Batten disease because if you know about, if you heard about Alzheimer's disease, if you heard about Parkinson's disease, and if you heard about epilepsy, these are like the common um, brain diseases. And now put all of these three together into a say six month old or a two year old kid, right? A, ch a child and like how horrible that could be, right? So that's what Batten disease is all about. So Batten disease is a predominantly a childhood disorder. It's a rare disease and um, it, it has all the components of all the bad things of Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease and epilepsy. And even sad part is these kids, they don't get to live beyond um, the age of 15 or 20 years. So, um, and there are 13 different forms of the disease. So you can't really work on one form. There are 13 different forms. And um, of course there are no cures of this disease. So um, we have uh, met kids um, with this disease. We have met their parents and they really, really want us to um, get a cure. But as you all know, I mean, getting a cure in like two years is not possible. It takes like decades to get a cure. Like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease are being studied for like decades, but still there are no cures. There are treatments, but there are no cures yet. Now, one common issue with this Batten disease, Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, and that's specifically what we study in our lab and what it makes more interesting is um, a typical, a particular component in the brain cells. So um, in our household, I'll give you an example, a general example. In our household, like um, when we cook, we we tend to create like a lot of garbage, right? And what we do is all the garbages um, go into the dustbin, right? In the garbage bin. Now, if we keep piling on the garbage bin or the dustbin, what happens after a few days? It becomes stinky, right? You can't really stay in your house. It becomes inhabitable and um, you have to probably leave the house either or you have to clean the bin, right? So in our cells, in every single cell in our body, we have a janitor, right? We have a person, we have an organelle who cleans the cells. And these janitors of the cells are called lysosomes. So these lysosomes are like tiny, tiny organelles sitting with, within every single cell. And these lysosomes, their main duty, main and main duty is to clean up the cell, to keep the cells clean and to recycle every single thing that are... Um, unused or unnecessary and put them back into the cells. Like take out the usable things, put them back into the cells and take out the uh, unusable things and put them out of the cells, right? So that's the um, main function of the lysosomes. But often in some diseases, these lysosomes are unhappy and that's when complications start. It leads to lysosomal, like unhappy lysosomes or lysosomal dysfunction leads to several diseases. And one of those categories is neurodegenerative diseases or brain diseases. And that includes Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, Batten disease, Huntington's disease, and all the diseases that you can name uh, when it comes to the brain. So um, what we do in Dunedin is um, coming back to the 
induce pluripotent stem cells. And I'll come back to why I talked about the lysosomes as well. So this image is basically a, of a group of um, induced pluripotent stem cells or the stem cells. And what we do, what we can do is we can turn them into neurons. These beautiful looking uh, stringy structures that you can see um, are the human neurons. Uh, they are electrically active. Um, so you can send messages, you can receive messages through these neurons. And these neurons can be used to mimic any disease in a dish because these neurons are literally growing on a piece of uh, plastic dish. And they can be used for high throughput uh, drug screening the way I, uh, I illustrated or explained in the first few slides and to understand disease mechanisms. So what our, we, we have introduced another very cool and new technology which is called gene editing. And what we have done is we have taken these stem cells and we have started editing the genes. Now, when it comes to gene editing, it basically means um, cutting and copying and pasting things, right? So our genome or the human genome or any genome is like a barcode, right? So in a barcode, you'll find like different lines, right? And those barcodes need to be in specific lines in specific order for the barcode to work. In our body, in our genome, the way that the barcodes are um, uh, placed, they should be also in specific manner for the genome to work, for the genome to give rise to a gene, to an RNA, to um, a protein, right? If there is a problem, if there is a problem, for example, this particular code barcode has been taken away, um, or if, there, if this barcode is taken away and replaced by something which doesn't belong here, that brings in the mutations. And if you have the mutations, that's when problem happens. And um, the cool technique that we are trying is called CRISPR-Cas9. And what we can do with the CRISPR-Cas9 is we can correct these mutations. We can insert mutation to create a disease model, and then we can correct the mutation to see how we can actually um, cure the disease. So using this gene editing technique or the CRISPR-Cas9, um, we are making our mutations in these neurons, and then we are studying the disease mechanism. For example, if it's a Parkinson's disease, if it's a Batten disease, if it's an Alzheimer's disease, we're studying all the mechanisms, we're studying all the possible proteins, and then we are rectifying or correcting this mutation using the same tool so that we can find a cure um, that can actually rectify the actual disease in a human being. So saying that, um, I would like to show you some data that we have generated in our lab using these neurons and this, um, this cool technology called CRISPR. So what you are seeing over here on the left-hand side is a bunch of healthy neurons. If you, can see, um, if you can see these blue string-like structures, these are the healthy neurons. And now I'm coming back to the lysosomes. Remember I was talking about the janitors that keep the cells clean. So these red dots that you are seeing are basically those lysosomes. So what's happening over here is the neurons are functioning normally because these red dots, the functional lysosomes, the janitors of the cells are actually continuously keeping the cells clean. However, when we mimic this, mimic this Batten disease, we see that in these blue cells, the neurons, the number of these red lysosomes or the functional lysosomes is decreased. That's because we still don't know why the lysosomes are affected because of the mutations. We created a mutation and we ended up with less functional um, lysosomes. So what's going to happen when we have less, less uh, functional lysosomes? We will have toxicity building up in the cells which will lead up to death of the cells. So again, as I mentioned, as I gave the uh, example of cleaning our houses, uh, if we do not clean our houses, what happens is like it gets stinky and either we have to clean the house or we have to leave the house. So at this point, if, there, if these lysosomes are not functional, that means the garbage is piling up in the cells, which means the cells become inhabitable and ultimately these neurons die. So that's how um, these um, diseases work. Like at least one of, the, uh, uh, one of the reasons that the neurons die is basically dysfunctional lysosomes. And this is common in not just in Batten disease, but also in Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease as well. Now, the other cool thing that we have found was using the same um, uh, neurons, 
was to look at enzymes. Now, these lysosomes that I was talking about, the janitors, how do they clean up these um, garbage? They have particular enzymes. And what these enzymes do is they, these enzymes basically chew up these um, um, garbage and that's how they recycle every single garbage. Now in the healthy neurons, again, one on the left-hand side, you can see that there is a lot of this red color coming in the neurons. And these red colors are nothing but active enzymes in the lysosome. But then when you compare this picture with the right-hand side picture, which is the Batten disease neurons, you will see like there is some of the red color present in all the neurons, but it has gone down like drastically as compared to the healthy neurons, which kind of says that the lysosomes are dysfunctional and hence there is less active enzyme uh, left in the lysosome. Now, if there is less active enzyme le left in the lysosome, what happens? The chewing process is faulty, hence the garbage piles up, hence the, um, uh, the neurons become inhabitable again and they um, ultimately die. So that's what we are doing in, um, in terms of Batten disease. We have used these neurons for uh, Parkinson's disease study as well. For example, um, this graph is showing the lysosome function. So basically this is the, um, again, same graph or the same pictures that I showed you in this slide. So if you go back to this slide, it's basically looking at the lysosome function and in the healthy neurons, you can say it's pretty good. And whereas in the Parkinson's neurons, there is like a 40% decrease of um, the lysosome function, which again leads to the, function, uh, the death of the neurons. There is another protein, um, uh, which is called alpha synuclein. I don't need to or like get into the details of it, but this protein is dysfunctional in Parkinson's disease. What you are seeing in the left-hand side picture is healthy neurons and normal level of the protein, but in Parkinson's disease neurons, this protein levels, the dark green spots, the, part, the protein levels increases. That's because one of the reasons is the lysosomes cannot degrade this protein. And that's why this protein levels increases and um, uh, it leads to um, toxicity inside the toxicity buildup inside the cells, which again leads to the death of the neurons. So these are kind of the researches that we are doing in our, um, in our lab currently. But this does not um, limit the application of the stem cells that um, we are using only for making neurons. What else we can do with these stem cells? As I said, we are already making neurons. We are also making astrocytes. Remember the supportive cells that I talked about, like microglia and astrocytes, <clears throat> like the starship cells that were known to be the supportive cells, but they also have other functions like regulation of neurons. So we are testing these astrocytes and microglia as well in our um, uh, different systems that we are using. Um, apart from that, um, what else we are doing is, if you look into the current literature, um, you will see like there's a lot of papers that, that are coming out in big journals like Nature Medicine, where people are using or researchers are using IPSC, which stands for the induced pluripotent stem cells to model different kinds of brain diseases. Now, there is another new tool, new, new tool um, on the block, which is called organoid. Now, and this, uh, these organoids are becoming very hot topic um, in the, in, or it has become a very hot topic uh, in the last couple of years. So what these organoids are, so researchers have started from skin cell and they have moved into stem cell and then they have started making mini brain. Like these are tiny brain and they look like brain but they are not exactly representing um, brain. So um, the only drawback of um, this type of cells that we are using is, as I mentioned, we grow these cells on a flat um, di plastic dish. But is our brain flat? not really, right? Our brain is like globular. So we need to mimic that globular structure. And that's why scientists came up with these organoids, which are like globular structures. And I'll, I'll play a video um, right now. And, and that will explain what these um, brain organoids or mini brains are. So here we go, hang on. And there you go. The human brain is complex. There's a lot we know about it, and there's still a lot left to learn. But there's only so much we can find out from traditional ways of studying the brain. 
So researchers at Novartis and other organizations are taking a different approach. They're growing brain organoids in the lab. In the past, in order to study neurons, we had to use neurons from mice or from rats um, in order to have the cell type that might be affected in disease. However, mice and rats don't naturally come down with schizophrenia or, with, or Parkinson's. And so there's some limitations to what you can learn from studying rodent neurons. And so we really need to be able to study the human brain if we want to understand the human brain. But that's easier said than done. It's been difficult in the past to acquire human brain tissue. So the brain is locked within the skull, and so it's very hard to get a biopsy, and then it's very hard to keep that tissue alive. But this is all changing with this scientific breakthrough. The breakthrough really came from our ability to use induced pluripotent stem cell technology to be able to grow um, an organoid uh, in the lab. So an organoid is a three-dimensional organ that mimics a three-month-old human embryonic brain. It has very similar structure where it has a ventricle, it has... Um, these cells, which are called progenitor cells, which give rise to all of the neurons. It's only a few millimeters in diameter, um, and it also cannot think or learn or process information. It doesn't have sensory input, and so it can't learn or form memories. Apologies. Even though these, I, I just need to stop this presentation just for a minute. I'm having some technical issues. Um, okay, I can start screen sharing my screen. process information. It doesn't have sensory input, and so it can't learn or form memories. Even though these organoids are, are very young in development, they still have human neurons. They still start to form connections similar to the human brain. The researchers build the organoids by taking skin or blood cells from a patient, reprogramming them into stem cells, and giving the stem cells cues to coax them to become neurons, which self-organize and connect with each other. This provides a platform for studying brain diseases as they've never been studied before. So the ability to grow human neurons in a dish now allows us to study the very cell type that is most affected in disease. We can study a neuron from a patient that has schizophrenia. We can study a neuron from a patient with Parkinson's disease to try to learn what has gone wrong and try to fix it. So that's all about um, these organoids. Aren't they cool? Like, um, so you can actually make these tiny brains um, on a dish, basically. And they are not like as a flat sheet of uh, neurons, but they are actually mimicking our human brains with different kinds of cells coming in. You can put whatever cells you want to, and they can be used to um, um, uh, test different drugs or understand disease mechanisms. So that's where we are uh, taking our research to. So I'm bringing, I'm trying to bring in these kind of um, uh, technology to our uh, lab and to the university. And that's where our, the future of stem cells is leading to. So um, up till now, everything was going um, brilliantly for us until we hit the month of March. And guess what happened in the month of March? COVID-19 and everything came to a standstill. And um, we were, it was very frustrating. Um, we are still kind of like coping up with um, what has happened worldwide. As you all know, there are like almost half a million death, uh, more than half a million death, 11.2 uh, million uh, cases. These are numbers from yesterday. Um, but we are fortunate enough in uh, New Zealand that um, the lockdown came kind of like pretty early and um, it was mostly effective, I would say, very effective, I would say. There are like 1,536 cases um, um, till today and um, there were 22 deaths um, and the numbers are going up because the borders are opening just for like Kiwi residents, um, but we are not opening the borders for um, any other countries right now. And we have gone through all the four levels of lockdown at one point, like we have spent like five weeks under level four, where I was literally going to grocery shopping once every two weeks. I was not at all uh, going out of um, the out my house. Then we went to level three, uh, two weeks in level three, two weeks in level two, and we are currently at uh, level one. Even in level three, it was so much restricted that uh, it was hard to get back to work. Um, and when all of these things are happening, 
new and new researches are coming up um, with this COVID-19, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and more and more data is uh, data are coming up showing that it's not just a disease of the respiratory organ, it's also a disease of several other organs. And um, patients, like almost like 50% of the patients have actually um, uh, complained about um, symptoms which are generally linked to the brain. For example, um, patients have um, complained about dizziness, headache, um, consciousness, impaired consciousness and inflammation and uh, stroke and seizure and epilepsy. Then two of the very um, common um, uh, initial symptoms are like loss of taste and loss of smell. And these two are also coming from the brain. These two are controlled by the brain neurons. And there are also some muscular pain that has been reported. So, um, so it, it cannot be like a coincidence that everything is happening at one um, uh, time. There must be some biology behind that. And um, it happens that um, it turns out to be that these viruses can actually cross the blood brain barrier, the barrier that saves the brain from every single outer organs or outer items. Um, um, it can actually cross the blood-brain barrier, get inside the brain and cause disease or whatever um, it is causing. So um, what we did was, or what we are doing is using this uh, induced pluripotent stem cell derived neurons, we are actually um, making, um, or we are actually testing how these viruses can cause injury or can cause anomaly in these neurons. So these, this is a typical neuron. These are the viral components. And we got like two grants from uh, Brain Health Research Center, Brain Research New Zealand and Otago Medical Research Foundation. And um, what we are doing currently is uh, we are um, uh, adding the virus to the cells and it's a strictly um, like very regulated um, uh, environment. I can't go in there because I'm not allowed to. Um, I've got a colleague who is doing that experiment and um, when he is done infecting the cells with the virus, he is giving back uh, the cells to me. And um, I am actually looking at the anomalies that is happening in the cells. And one cool thing that we have found out was, um, or is uh, that some cells are infected, some cells are not infected. We don't know what's the mystery behind it, but what we are afraid of is what will be the lasting effect or what will be the uh, long-term future effect um, of this COVID-19. So these cells or these viruses can actually stay in the brain for a long, long time. And we do not know, we are scared about like what will be the effect um, in say five years or 10 years. And that's why we are doing this research to find out um, like what's gonna happen. How can we know more of more and more about the mechanisms of what's going on in the cells when we have this SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 infection. And um, our research will definitely give some mechanistic um, answers, um, uh, which will um, probably lead the way to future um, potential uh, therapies. Mm -hmm. So with that, um, I would like to come to my acknowledgement slide. That's one of the most important slide. And thanks to all the organizers for um, um, inviting me to this virtual conference. Uh, special thanks to Dr. Sanjit Kumar Das and Dr. Devar Bhutapotra for inviting me to this, um, to give this talk. Thanks to my family. I know some of my family members are also watching me uh, right now. Thanks to my supervisors and colleagues, current and present. This is my uh, current lab. Um, this is my supervisor, uh, Stephanie Hughes. This was my lab in Philadelphia and uh, then to Utah. This is uh, Paul, Paul Bray. He was my supervisor. And this, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this was my PhD lab. I, um, this is Professor Simon Muller, my PhD supervisor. Um, thanks to all our collaborators in the US, the UK, New Zealand, and Norway. And thanks to all the funding organizations without which we wouldn't be able to um, do any of the research that we are doing currently. And finally, just a quick note. I mean, I mentioned that Durgapur probably is one of my favorite, not one of my, it's still my favorite um, places on this planet. But where I'm staying right now, it has a lot of similarities with Durgapur. It's called, uh, this, uh, this town is called uh, Dunedin. And um, you will see like beautiful, beautiful places in Dunedin. Uh, so if anyone is planning on a vacation, please do come and let me know. 
And with that, I would like to end my talk and um, get any questions. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Boshak, for your uh, nice talk. Uh, we have several questions. Uh, one question is asking uh, Ushi Roy, what is migraine? Is there any treatment? Uh, her second question is, does taking sleep uh, sleeping pills regularly cause damaged brain cell? Hmm. Interesting question. Very good questions. Um, so migraine is, again, um, some neurons... Um, uh, behave differently under pressure. Now, our brain is a very complex, complex organism. Like, um, there are so many things that is happening in our brain. Like, for example, if we go under like too much stress, like, for example, I'll give my example. If I'm under too much stress, I start having headaches, right? And um, if, I, if I have headache, I, I can't really function. Now, what happens when there is stress is like there are some neurons which are trying to overwork and that's how they get exhausted and that's how they start dysfunctioning. And that's how all these like migraines and um, depression and um, uh, kind of like being under stress happens. Um, if that answers your question. Now, is there any treatment? There are certain drugs that can treat the, um, the pain. Um, but the problem is, again, um, as I said, the brain is very much protected by a layer called blood-brain barrier. So there are drugs that can cross the blood-brain barrier, which can treat the symptom. But the brain is so much unknown that we still don't know which specific neurons or which specific cell types to target. So that's why we do not have a um, particular medicine to cure migraine. We can treat symptoms of the migraine, but we do not have a cure for migraine yet. Um, does taking sleeping pills regularly cause damage um, brain cells? Yes, it could. Um, sleeping pills, definitely uh, what the way they work is like they kind of um, sometimes um, they sometimes kind of like put the neurons in a very sleepy state. Now, say um, if you want the neurons not to fire any stimulus or not to fire any electrical impulse, um, you want the cells to be quiet. That's fine. Fair enough. That's how you get the good sleep. But then when you want them to work, these sleeping pills can actually obstruct those cells to work normally. And that's when the damage happens. So again, I'm not a, a clinician or a, a neurologist. So that's why I'm not the best person to suggest um, whether to take um, sleeping pills regularly or not to take. Some people have to take because they um, uh, suffer from sleep um, deprivation, but Anything excess, anything regularly can cause uh, damage in the brain. Dr. Bosak, please close your presentation first. Yes, sure. sure. Another question, uh, our convener is asking, Professor Shishindu Shokar asking, what short-term and long-term side effect can we expect from the treatment of Parkinson's disease? Great question. So one of the um, one of the major major uh, treatment in Parkinson's disease is um, called um, uh, a drug called dopamine. Now, what happens is um, there, as I mentioned, like there is a particular type of neurons in the middle part of the brain. These these neurons are called dopaminergic neurons, and when they die. They really, they basically are there to release dopamine. When they die, the dopamine goes down. And when the dopamine goes down, your voluntary and involuntary movements, like for example, walking, uh, talking and uh, eating food or things like that become very dysfunctional. So in order to treat that, um, what the clinicians or the neurologists do is like they give L-dopa or levodopa or carbidopa as um, supplements to supplement the dopamine level in the brain. That's perfect. That actually improves um, uh, improves the symptoms a lot. That that uh, makes the disease uh, less severe. But of course, there are um, uh, side effects. So the side effect, one of the main side effects, is like 
this levodopa or the dopamine, when it enters the cells, the healthy cells, what it causes is um, it causes the production of um, a, a, a tiny um, like oxygen radical, oxygen radicals, which are called the uh, reactive oxygen species, which can actually lead to reactive uh, or oxidative stress and can damage the cells further. So now when you're giving the L-dopa or the levodopa, so it, it is supplementing the missing dopamine, but it's causing damage to the, the healthy cells. So that's how the short-term effect may be the good bit, but the long-term effect becomes um, that um, the healthy cells get affected. The healthy cells are now damaged. So that kind of um, explains like how the long-term and short-term um, effects can be, or the adverse effects can be from uh, the treatments that we have currently in um, Parkinson's disease. Now there are other treatments as well, like for example, electrical impulse. But again, if you're putting electricity through the brain, there are of course um, other effects as well, because you can't really, at this point, you can't really target specifically to those um, cells. So, um, but a lot of research have shown that uh, these electrical impulses are much more effective because um, these days uh, people, uh, researchers can actually use light to particularly target the cells that we are interested in. And that's how you can minimize the um, adverse effects. Dr. Boshak, uh, one question is from my side. Uh, yeah. What are the main and specific symptoms for Parkinson's disease? Uh, so that we can understand the old person, he or she is going through this uh, Parkinson's disease. Right. It's, it's a very interesting question. And to be honest with you, the answer is difficult because there are a lot of symptoms that you will see in Parkinson's disease, which also come up when you age, when we all age. Like, for example, when we get, get old, we trouble walk, We have trouble walking, right? We need a stick sometimes to walk around. We need someone's help. We, trouble, we have trouble eating and we have trouble remembering things or remembering people. These are some of the symptoms that come up in Parkinson's disease as well. So when these kind of symptoms come in, that doesn't mean that a person is um, suffering from Parkinson's disease. So the particular, there are certain tests that the clinicians or the neurologists do. Uh, one of the tests is like um, voluntary movement. Like for example, can you do this? Like as simple as this. If you have a parking, if someone is parking, uh, suffering from Parkinson's disease, they, they have trouble to do this as well. It is as simple as this test, but they tr have trouble to do this. Then there are um, movement um, uh, tests that you can perform, not you, but the neurologist uh, can perform. And um, those kind of tests, um, if you do not have Parkinson's disease, those kind of symptoms wouldn't come in. Like for example, if you say to raise your right arm and the person who is suffering for Parkinson's disease might have confusion and they might actually uh, lift their left arm. Um, so those kind of symptoms are uh, indicative that maybe there is a possibility of Parkinson's disease. So another question from my side, the toxicity due to magnesium is a reason for Parkinson's syndrome, right? Uh, so um, chelation, therapy, chelation therapy can be used for the treatment of Parkinson's disease. Uh, please light on this matter. What kind of therapy did you say? Chelation therapy. Right, chelation therapy. Okay, so yes, metal is another. Huh, that's that brings that brings me to my current grant that I got. I'm uh, looking at metal transporters um, in in the human brain. So metal is a definite um, problem, but chelation therapy um, it has to be very specific, and it ne it's needed to be delivered at the right spot. The problem with all the brain diseases is, as, as I have been telling like, throughout the um, uh, presentation, that our brain is a very complicated organ. And to get inside the particular type of cells, it's like the most, it's like the toughest thing to do. So chelation therapy can work if you can deliver that chelating agent to the right cells at the right time, at the right amount. Um, and um, But you have to make sure that it doesn't go through any other uh, cells because metals are essential in uh, normal functioning of cells. So you can't really um, take off the magnesium from other cells. So you have to be very specific. Uh, Dr. Salam, can we take any another question? Hello. If there, uh, if 
if anyone from the participant uh, want to ask question please raise your hand from participants end if anyone want to have any question please raise your hand uh, you should uh, end the session we have another speaker here uh, okay, i would request uh, dr okay, sanjit kumar das to proceed uh, thanks thanks dr boshak for your nice presentation uh, it's really interesting and also informative one uh, thanks you uh, uh, for sparing your valuable time uh, to uh, make our conference successful uh, hope we will meet again in such type of academic endeavor Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for um, letting me to share my research. Thank you. Now uh, we are in the inverted lecture session six, uh, where we have an eminent speaker, Dr. Deepak Prasad Duwari, Director, Research and Academics, MP Birla Institute of Fundamental Research, Kolkata. Uh, it's my privilege and honor to welcome and invite Dr. Duwari, uh, sir. We are really grateful to you for your consent. Thank you, sir. Now I request uh, Dr. Devbrutu Bhadru for introduction of our honourable speaker. Sir, welcome from Bharatcon 2020. and it is indeed a honor and privilege for me to introduce professor duwari uh, he has after graduation and master degree from jadavpur university he did his phd from ayuka pune from very distinguished professor in astrophysics professor jayanto vishnu narlikar he has several employments before he joined in uh, the director as research and academics mp birla institute of fundamental research he was in the tata institute of fundamental research uh, being the assistant professor institute for advanced studies in basic sciences iran followed by university of manchester institute of science and technology uk he has several awards and accolades in her name in his name uh, namely the best thesis award of the astronomical society of india gopal chandra bhattacharya memorial award very prestigious rubindra puraskar by government of west bengal recently and DSC honoris causa from SOA University Bhubaneswar Odisha he has several memberships in very recognized societies like Royal Astronomical Society member of International Astronomical Union fellow of Calcutta Mathematical Society Indian Association for General Relativity and Gravitation Indian Science Congress Association he has conducted several uh, conference uh, very prestigious conference in all over the globe and attended around 1500 lectures both technical and popular level at different school colleges university and research institutions and more than 350 live television interviews he has about 25 research publications in various reputed in international and national journals he has a book several books very importantly and now in preparation india space odissi is the teaching profession at honorary guest faculty at presidency university pg dip program in astronomy and planetarium course director of introductory evening course in astronomy and a few others he is the prestigious member of the advisory committee uh, in several positions and advisor of expert committees school textbooks and syllabus government of west bengal book committee at department of science and technology government of west bengal so with this uh, brief introduction i would like to request uh, dr duwari sir to uh, give his deliberation thank you for accepting our invitation sir over to you sir okay thank you very much it's a wonderful feeling to be a part of this uh, webinar the conference also and it's a privilege for me to be invited by such an august institute two institutes putichil college and bhairav ganguli college and i personally feel that this is a very timely way of trying to not only talk to young minds but also to give them a concept and ideas about what is there around us 
in a much bigger concept. So in these particular circumstances, what I will try to say is that today I'm uh, the the topic of my lecture is a cosmic voyage. That's a very broad sort of spectrum title. So under the cosmic voyage, what I have decided to talk about is the most fascinating and most interesting from scientific point of view, the story of the stars, that is the life cycle of stars. And since it is for undergraduate students, I have tried to keep the level at a minimal mathematical prospect aspect. And I will try to uh, talk to the students and try to tell them the understanding, the bigger understanding of the nature, how we can understand by observing and by making new theories and ideas about stars. So let me first share my screen so that we can uh, start the lecture in reality. Okay, my young friends, a cosmic voyage. Basically, what does it mean? As we are really in these difficult times of a pandemic, and we are trying to trying to fathom what is there in the future, most of us are trying to get into a mold which will keep our mind positive and running. And in that respect, sky is also very important because from our childhood days, sky has thrown up thrown up a lot of questions and queries in our minds. And somehow the regular curriculum, we are not able to really answer those queries and questions that is there. But now the subject of astronomy and astrophysics has become very, very important. And that is the reason there is huge amount of interest globally about this subject. So as I mentioned before my presentation, Though the title is Cosmic Void, but what we'll be talking about is the realm of stars. Thousands of years back, when our ancestors used to look into the sky, they used to wonder, what is sky? Where is sky? What are those objects, those lighted dots that we call stars? And is there any connection between the stars and the earth? With these set of questions and queries, the subject of astronomy was born. So astronomy can be considered as one of the oldest subjects that human minds have dwelt upon. At the same time, given the huge number of news items in television channels and news channels, you get an idea that it is also one of the most happening subjects in the recent times. Astronomy as a subject has the power it can tell us what was the physical situation in our surrounding areas or where we are standing millions of years back. At the same time, it can give us a hint what will be the situation in this sort of regions millions of years later. So spanning a vast expanse of space and time, the subject that deals is astronomy. And scientists all over the world are realizing that soon the 21st century may be termed as a century for astronomy and astrophysics. And that is the reason throughout the world there is a tremendous amount of effort going on in building up infrastructures, new technologies, new instruments, to look into the depth of the sky. Just to give you an example, in this inhospitable terrain in the Pyrenees mountain of France, they have built this observatory called Pic du Midi. The cost of building this observatory was around $300 million. One of the largest island in the Hawaiian, uh, Hawaiian archipelago called Mauna Kea. On top of Mauna Kea, six countries have created nine observatories the biggest one causes cost is around $500 million. So that gives you an idea of what a tremendous amount of effort, even in terms of finance, is going on to understand the sky. Not only in optical, in radio wavelengths also, huge, huge infrastructures are being built. This is one of the, one of the best. It's a 100, feet, 100 meter dish antenna in Germany, which is looking into the dark depth of the cosmos in radio waves. But we know the largest telescope is yet to be functional. The work has started in 2014. And India is one of the proud associates of this TMT, 30-meter telescope project, with a 30-meter mirror at the heart of it. 
The cost of building this telescope is so huge that not a single country is able to build it. Five countries are collaborating to build this telescope. USA, Canada, China, Japan, and India. The Indian contribution for building this telescope will be a whooping 1,700 crore rupees. Not only that, some of you have must, must have heard about SCA, Square Kilometer Array Project. It is one of the biggest projects in astronomy in terms of in radio wavelength bands. And when fully functional, it will be 10 times more efficient than any radio antenna that is there on our Earth. It comprises of 200 dish antennas in South Africa and 1,30,000 small dipole antennas in Australia. And amazingly, India is one of the international main international partner of the SCAR project. In 2016, you have all learned that how a theory predicted, a theory given by Albert Einstein in 1916 predicted the presence of gravitational wave, the space time getting ripples because of two very heavy compact objects going around each other. And this gravitational wave was discovered in two fantastic laboratories in US called LIGO, Laser Interferometric Gravitational Observatory. And the first international associate of LIGO is India. In the state near the state of Karnataka and Tamil Nadu, they have started the process of building the Indigo project, Indian Gravitational Observatory. So it's an extremely exciting time, not only for the general people, for the students, but also for students who want to look into the future in India, because huge amount of resources will be needed to man these projects, to understand the sky like never before. <clears throat> the night sky, <clears throat> thousands of years back, when our ancestors used to look into the night sky, they used to wonder what is the meaning behind those lighted dots, but they couldn't find an answer. But in their desperation, what they did, they chose different parts of the sky, identified closely space stars, joined the stars to straight lines, and created imaginary figures. In this way, the whole sky was divided into 88 regions, each region being governed by an imaginary figure, which we today call constellations of Taramandal. These are imaginary, but they're still helpful. Just to give you an example, if you, have, if you have gone for a hitchhiking and lost your way, and you, do, you want to go to the south direction, but which is the southern direction? If you happen to see the Shaptarshi Mandal, or the Big Deeper, as it is called in the Western parlance, take the last two stars, join them in your mind, produce it under the sky, it will heat up on a single star, and that star is the pole star. So the moment you get to know the pole star, you know which is north, south, east, and west. Let us talk about the sky and the earth. Let us consider the earth at the center and the sky like the inside of a globe. Take the equator of the earth in your mind. Produce it onto the sky. On the sky, it will create a great circle. Let us call it the celestial equator. Now, you all know, earth is going around the sun once in 365.25 days. But to us, it appears, since the sky is just a two-dimensional surface, it appears as if sun is going around the earth once in one year. This apparent imaginary path of the sun on the sky is called the ecliptic, the loci of eclipses. You also all know that Earth is going around the sun around an axis, and it goes around itself once in 24 hours around another axis. And these two axes are not parallel, they're inclined but an angle of 23 and a half degrees. Since they're inclined to one another, two imaginary planes, the blue colored celestial equatorial plane and the yellow colored ecliptic plane, they will intersect each other along a straight line. And the endpoints of the straight lines are of little importance. The first endpoint is called the point of vernal equinox. The word equinox comes from Latin. It means equal nights. 21st or 22nd of March, sun appears at that point. <laughs> Sorry, some, somebody's uh, audio is visible in a... Yeah. Thank you. 21st or 22nd of March, sun appears at that point, And that date is exactly equal amount of daytime and nighttime for every person on Earth. March, April, May, 21st or 22nd of June, sun appears at the northernmost point of this plane. And that day for the northern hemisphere people, it is the longest day and the shortest night. 27, 22nd September, sun comes over here, equal amount of daytime and nighttime. And 22nd December, sun comes here. At least for the northern hemisphere people, that is the shortest and the longest night. So you see this continuous variation that we are so accustomed to is happening because just because of this accidental tilt of 23 and a half degrees. 
Now let us talk about the sun, moon, and the earth. You may be wondering that why I am talking about very basic things which are nowadays taught in LKG 1 and LKG 2. But believe me, there are certain facts of which we are not very much aware. For example, how, how many of you can answer what is the speed of the earth around the sun? Amazing. 29.5 kilometers per second. Imagine a car in one second moving 30 kilometers. You will say not possible. But we are actually experiencing that every second of our existence. For example, change of season. This occurs because just of the accidental tilt of 23 and a half degrees of the earth spinning axis and the revolution axis around the sun. It is because of that, at some point when earth is on this left hand side of sun, sunlight is falling directly onto the north and slantingly onto the south, more energy getting re-radiated onto the sky, onto the atmosphere in north than south. And it is summer in the north, winter in the south. Six months later, it is just the opposite. Now it becomes winter in the north and summer in the south. You can also wonder what is the physical significance of mentioning this information in a lecture like this. The answer is, if there were no change of seasons, there would have been no life on earth. Just to give you an idea, if there were no change of seasons, there would have been no ocean currents. And if there were no ocean currents, there would have been no air currents in the atmosphere. And if there are no air currents in our atmosphere, clouds would not have born somewhere and gathered somewhere else and gave us rain and fresh water. So life would not have been possible on Earth. Amazing. Eclipse. We all know about the geometry of the eclipse, the sun, the moon, and the Earth coming in a straight line in small patches of Earth. Sometimes we see that the moon has totally blocked the sun. And this is a wonderful picture taken from space, how the shadow of the moon has fallen across a part of the globe of the earth. And the next picture is more dramatic. As Earth is spinning, see how the shadow of the moon crosses the part of the globe. That is called the path of total solar eclipse. Now, it was during the eclipse, sun was discovered as a new avatar. They found out from the surface of the sun, milky white radiation coming out, which cannot be seen on the other times. When they asked themselves a question, what is causing this, they were amazed with the answer. They found out from the surface of the sun every second, 16 lakh tons of charged particles are coming out. These charged particles, as they move through the magnetic field of the sun, they produce this milky white radiation. The average velocity of these charged particles are 450 kilometers per second. With that energy, they have enough momentum. If they heat any atom or molecule, it will instantaneously break apart. So basically that means, if I now stand on the sun, the charged particle coming from the surface of the sun, the moment they hit my body, within fraction of a second, my whole body should disintegrate. But I am alive. How? I think you know, but we will discuss it a little later. Tides. Tides play a tremendously important role in evolution of life on land. So that we are here today is because high tides and low tides were there. So if I ask you the question, why does tide occur? Most of you know the answer, the tide occur because moon is attracting the water on the surface of the earth. But my friend, if you do a small calculation of GA1 M2 by R square, you can show sun is attracting the water on the earth 47% than the moon does. Then why we always say it is moon which is attracting? Because tide is not a force. It is rather a force derivative. M1 M2 by R cube effectively. And that is the reason moon being 384,000 kilometers away and sun being 15 crore kilometers away, moon wins the battle. But again, if I ask you the question, uh, this is the relation actually in the bottom line, you can see the tidal force is mm by r cube effectively. So now if I ask you the question that if moon occurs on one side of the earth, the water should be bulging towards the moon, what happens to the antipodal of the other? It is also a tide there. Why then? The answer is because the tide is interplay between two forces. Into the force of attraction towards the moon and the centrifugal force that the earth faces because of the moon's motion around, having the centripetal force on it, the centrifugal force is faced by the earth. So if you do the interaction of this, at one side, the side facing the moon, it is gravitational force. On the other side, at the antipodal point, it is the centrifugal force which wins over and gives you two tides at the same time on the opposite parts of the globe. Moon, beautiful picture taken from the surface of the moon. What it is? According to the scientists, 452 crore years back or 4.52 billion years back, 
a huge ball of rock came and slammed onto the earth with such a huge force. Huge amount of surface material got gouged up and was thrown up in space. It couldn't go away forever, but going to a very vast distance for millions of years, it condensed, coagulated, coalesced, and has given birth to our moon. This theory goes by the name, the collision ejection theory. Now, my friend, after that initial introduction to our sun, earth, moon, let us begin our journey out of the earth, what's bound into the space and time. Why? Why I'm using the word in space and time? Because of the concept that light travels at a velocity of three lakh kilometer per second in vacuum. The distance between sun to our 15 crore kilometers, if I do a simple division, any class eight textbook will be writing that light time, the light coming time from sun to earth is 8.3 light minutes. Or light takes 8.3 minutes to come from sun to earth. What does it basically mean? It means if I go out now, look at the sun for a fraction of a second, I'll have to tell myself the image of the sun that I'm seeing is an image which is 8.3 minutes old. The closest star, Proxima Centauri, 4.2 light years away. Today evening, if the sky is clear, look at the star and tell yourself the star that you are seeing is the image of the star 4.2 years back and you are seeing it now. So next time, if one of your younger generation asks you, requests you to take you to the science city and spend 50 rupees on a time machine ride, never. Just go out into the open in a clear night, look into the sky. As you tilt your head, the deeper you are seeing, you're deeper seeing your own past. So basically, we do a time travel in the past whenever we look into the night sky. The solar system, these are all main avatars of the solar system. Sun and Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune and poor Pluto has been kicked out. Sun, Sun is a ball of gas. How come the ball of gas is not just dissipating away in the sky? What does the scientist say? According to the scientist, 4.6 billion years back or 460 crore years back, a huge ball of gas and dust was floating in space. This gas cloud was made up of, in terms of number of particles, 91% hydrogen, 8% helium, 1% rest other elements. In terms of mass, 74% hydrogen, 25% helium, and 1% rest other elements. The average temperature of this gas cloud was minus 240 degrees centigrade. At this cold temperature, only one type of universal force comes into play. That is the force of self-gravity. The force of self-gravity will attract the periphery of these gas clouds towards the center. As the gas goes towards the center, the central density rises as the density builds up. The pressure rises as the pressure builds up, temperature rises. And starting from minus 240 degrees centigrade, the temperature rose to a fascinating level of 1.5 crore degrees centigrade which is enough for effectively four hydrogen nuclei or four protons to come together, fuse together and produce a helium nucleus. This thermo thermonuclear fusion reaction has been, has been experimented on Earth, but till today they cannot efficiently contain it, right? So they use this reaction to explode a hydrogen bomb. But inside the sun in a very regulated manner, when these four hydrogen nuclei, as if they come together, fuse together and produce a helium nucleus, a huge amount of energy is produced. As the energy tries to come out from the central region, they produce a back pressure or a radiation pressure. This radiation pressure, when it exactly balances and matches the inward force of gravity, sun being a ball of gas, remains hanging there for millions of years without dissipating. Amazing stuff. How did the solar system happen? It was a huge cloud of gas and dust floating in space with a small spin. As it was contracting because of the spin, because of the conservation of angular momentum, it condensed into a disk. At the central part of the disk, where the temperature rose to 1.5 crore, sun is born, and in the outer periphery, where the temperature is less, gas and dust condensed, coagulated, coalesced, and has given birth to the planetary system. If I bring down the sun from the sky and cut it like a watermelon, inside there are three regions, the very central part where the thermonuclear fusion reaction is going on is called the core. In the energy that is produced inside the core, as it tries to freely flow over a huge volume, this region is called the radiative zone. And sun is very funny looking from the surface up to a depth of 650 to 700 kilometers, columns of gas, pillars of gas stacked one after another. Heat comes from inside, hits the bottom layer of the gas pillar as the gas, when it is heated, it rises up, comes to the surface, deposits the heat as sunlight and goes down and bridges the heat continuously from inside. This is called the convective zone. Outwardly, sun is again divided into three regions. The sun that you get to see in the early morning or late evening is called the photosphere. 
Over the photosphere in a very thin layer, exquisite, exquisitely pink colored gas can be seen, and that is called the chromosphere. And over the chromosphere for thousands of kilometers, milky white radiation, it is called corona. Nothing to do with coronavirus. Corona means crown. It's a Latin word, as if sun is wearing a crown. This is a true picture of the surface of the sun, the photosphere. You see this sort of mottled surface. Each is, each is indicating a column of gas. As the gas is coming through the middle of the column, it is lighted. The moment it comes on the surface, deposits the heat as sunlight becoming cold and like a fountain going down. It is typically dark in color. This is another beautiful picture of a chromosphere taken during a total solar eclipse, spikes of gas coming out of it. They are called spike hues. And one of the most fascinating picture is a corona, milky white radiation coming out from the surface of the sun. And this is an amazing stuff. Sun sometimes becomes active. You get to see black splotches, colored habbas on the surface of the sun, sometimes one, sometimes 10, 20 in a group. They are called sunspots. What are they? The surface temperature of sun is five and a half thousand degrees centigrade. At that temperature, no gas can remain as gas. It becomes plasma. Plasma has a property. Wherever there is a magnetic field, plasma will try to get repelled from it. On the surface of the sun, very randomly, small pockets of magnetism do form. As the column of plasma from the inside, bringing the heat from inside as it tries to come out, if it realizes that there is a magnetic field on the top, it will not come out from that region. It will take the heat away from different directions and no heat comes out from that and it looks like dark. This picture taken by the Solar Dynamical Observatory costed the US taxpayers around $1.2 billion. Why? Because sun is a very active object. Sun is not smooth, like a egg yolk. Every second, huge amount of explosions are happening. Thousands of tons of gas are getting thrown out from the surface, reaching a height of 20 to 25,000 kilometers, making beautiful arch and loops falling back onto the surface. Sometimes they're thrown out with such a force, they go detached from the surface of the sun and flow past the whole solar system like a solar wind or the solar storm sometimes. Just see the next picture. Isn't it amazing? Do you know how big is the cavity? How big is this cavity? Three earth can go side by side inside this cavity. And just, that, that just reminds us that we, we take sun for granted. But sun itself is an amazing object. And as I told you, this charged particle, if they fall onto our body or anything, it instantaneously poof, evaporation. Why we're alive? By accident. By a cosmic accident, our earth behaves like a bar magnet. And around the earth, like a peels of an orange, there is a magnetic shield. This charged particle, they come and slam onto the magnetic shield, cannot enter, go past the earth, and we think we are the king and queen of ourselves. But if you remember your childhood days of drawing the magnetic lines of force of a bar magnet in the north and southern magnetic polar region, there are open field lines. This charged particle entered the earth's atmosphere through these open field lines. Before hitting the ground, they interact with the air molecules and make them glow. And what did you get to see? Aurorase. Aurora Borealis in Northern Hemisphere or Australis in Southern Hemisphere. This picture was taken by me quite some time back, at least one and a half decades back, in the northernmost part of Norway. And it gives you the beauty, not only of the Aurora Borealis, it gives you the realization that how sun is interacting every second with Earth. And not only that, this, gives to a, this, this has given rise to a new term called space weather. Because this charged particle, if they come in huge numbers, all with a tremendous momentum, they can cause tremendous amount of change at the, at the electron density or the ions. And the ionospheric change can cause havoc with the telecommunication signal system or even satellite communication. So in that sense, though we think that sun is there, comes up every morning, goes down every evening, but it plays a tremendously important role if you are talking about the sun. And for this, you all know that Parker Solar Probe, sent by NASA, has already made a couple of very close approach to sun to understand the coronal region so that we can know much bigger, much more about the closest star that we have. Solar system, you all know how it formed. When the sun was getting born at the middle part of the disk, in the outer periphery, gas and dust condensed, coagulated, gave rise to very hot spherical objects for millions of years. They dissipated away the heat and lit 
and at least the first four mercury venus art mars became rocky solid terrestrial whereas jupiter saturn uranus and neptune are mostly made up made out of gas this is a collage of all the true color pictures of the planets of solar system i'm not going into the details of it because our focus is somewhere else but mars is important because for the last 15 years every now and then every 3 months or 2 months you get to see in the newspaper or media mars something to do with mars why because of these beautiful landmarks as if liquid water has flown through the surface of mars millions of years back and liquid water on earth means life so was there life on mars is there still life on mars and repeatedly they have found proofs direct proofs of presence of water ice as you can see through this whitish sediments and see the pebbles over here and after four days they are not to be seen not only that they have got the indication of floating liquid water very salty brine but definitely water on the surface of mars and that is the reason when curiosity went up in 2012 the pictures that they have sent back is amazing the dried up river beds just like what we see in the chotanagpur plateau area during the summer time pebbles right when you go to a small rivulet right or a fountain you will see these sort of pebbles because stones while rolling through water breaks up smashes against each other and smoothens because of the flow of the water so definitely there was liquid water someday on mars and when the whole scientific world was excited in 2012 it was the declaration of the in 15th at 15th of august by the then prime minister about the indian mission to mars amazing nobody abroad could think that india will be successful but we all know 24th september in 2013 2014 Mars orbiter mission or Mangaljaan successfully entered the Martian orbit. And believe me, my friend, it is still working. It's an amazing, amazing achievement of NASA. Not only NASA, ISRO, sorry, I'm not, it's NASA. Uh, amazing ach achievement of ISRO, right? See, we are so accustomed in saying anything to do with space is NASA. No, I'm sorry extremely. It is ISRO's fully indigenous project. And this also gives an idea to the young students, to the young minds, how you can contribute yourself meaningfully for the society, for the country, for space research, and in turn, for yourself. The pictures that, was, that has been taken by Mangaljaan is amazing. NASA has bought around 300 pictures from ISRO because the, they are so, so high resolution from two-dimensional photography, you can make three-dimensional topography. Asteroids, very important objects, though they are small, the largest was discovered in 1801, 900 kilometers in diameter by Joseph Piazza, an Italian astronomer. They thought a new planet has been discovered. But within a couple of years, three more, Pallas, Vesta, and Juno, each around 500 kilometers were discovered between the orbit of Mars and Jupiter. They know a new class of objects has been discovered. And starting from 1801 till today, thousands and thousands and thousands pieces of rock, 10, 20, 30, 40 has been discovered between the orbit of Mars and Jupiter going around Sun. They are called asteroids. This picture gives you a tremendously important information. Here, each green dot is a discovered asteroid, and each red dot are called Apollo asteroids because their orbit intersects the orbit of Earth. So they are, as they are going around the sun at any point of time, they can hit, come and hit the Earth. So life on Earth is accidental. And in, the, in, in this last six months or so, in the internet, tremendous amount of sort of excitement about asteroids coming close by to earth and hitting the earth probably and killing everybody but my friend that's a very remote chance the asteroids that are coming they are not very close sometimes four sometimes six sometimes three and a half lakh kilometer from earth and they pass by but it's, it's a little scary when you see this motions of asteroids around the sun in this regular manner asteroids are important and Japanese spacecraft Hayabusa has taken this photograph of Itakawa 8, telling us it's not a solid object, it's loose gravel, which are bound together by gravity. Not only that, Hayabusa 2 landed onto an asteroid called Ryogu. And this is the first picture of the surface of an asteroid taken from a spacecraft which has landed on it. Huge amount of mineral deposits have been found in these asteroids. So the future is of asteroid mining. 
for the betterment of the human society. We know that now we are not considering only nine planets in the solar system because of this discovery of this object called 2003, UB313 on 16th of November, 2003. Now the official name is Eris, E-R-I-S. It takes 557 years to go around the sun once, but it is bigger than Pluto. And that is the reason scientists, astronomers have decided, the general consensus is that there are two types of planets in the solar system. Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, these will be called classical planets. A new class of object has been nomenclature. They are called dwarf planets. Pluto, Eris, Sere. Initially, these were the dwarf planets. But in 2015, two more has been incorporated, Eumia and Makemake. The search for water. It was NASA's slogan that we should search for water. And definitely, not only in Mars, in the moons of Jupiter, Europa, they have found the scratch marks, giving the scientists the impetus to theorize that the surface of Jupiter is 10 to 15 kilometers thick water ice. Inside, there is a huge amount of liquid warm water. This liquid water from inside is giving it a push. Cracks are happening. And this has been proved beyond doubt when the spacecraft Cassini was, was flying over a satellite of Saturn called Enceladus. You see the plumes of water coming out. So, Scientists have now tested this machine called Cryobot, which will be sent to Enceladus and Europa in 2024. By 2029, they will reach, drill through the 15 kilometer thick ice. And when they find liquid water, they will try to see life. But let us actually start our journey out of the solar system. These are all true pictures of the solar system. You may ask, you do not see it when you look into the night sky. The problem is with the human eye. Human eye has certain thing called perception of vision. Within one tenth of a second, whatever amount of light enters through our pupil falls on the retina. Immediately, the optic nerve takes them to the back of our head at the optic lobe and creates an image. Our eyes cannot integrate light like a CCD chip. Your eye, if our eyes were like a CCD chip looking in the, at the sky for 10, 15, 20 hours, we'd have seen almost every dot in the sky is a star, every point. And there are huge gas clouds of all types of saturation, hue, color, everything. Are all the stars like the sun? Answer yes or no. Why yes? Because stars are burning hydrogen to helium at the core. Why no? Because most of the stars, they come with different initial mass, different surface temperature, and different chemical compositions. In terms of mass, stars come, come with the varying masses of, say, in the range of 0 0.08 to 100 times the mass of sun. 0 0.08 is the minimum mass needed for not only hydrogen to fuse, but also helium to fuse after that, right? And then 100 times solar mass, more than that, it will be so heavy, the star cannot hold itself by self-gravity and can collapse. Or where typically one solar mass means 2 to 23 by 33 kilograms. And not only four hydrogen nuclei as if coming together, it never happens that way. Two protons or hydrogen nuclei coming together produces a deuterium. One deuterium with another proton gives rise to a three helium. And two three heliums fusing together produces a four helium and two protons. So effectively as if four protons giving rise to a helium nucleus. This is called PP, proton-proton chain reaction. But in some cases, a heavier mass starts, another process takes over. Here also four protons give rise to a helium, but carbon, 12 carbon plays a role similar, similar to a catalyst's role in a chemical reaction. See, you know, it's not a chemical reaction, it's a, it's a nuclear fusion reaction. But 12 carbon with one proton give rise to 13 nitrogen. Again, with 13 nitrogen decays into 13 carbon, and then with one proton, it becomes 14 nitrogen. Another proton makes it 15 oxygen to 15 uh, nitrogen, which decays back to 12 carbon and one helium with addition of one proton. In terms of surface temperature, stars can be classified in a different way. Stars can come with the surface temperature of 50,000 degrees centigrade to 1,800 degrees centigrade. And depending on this, classif on, on this temperature scale, mostly, and spectra, it was a legendary woman 100 years back at the Harvard Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory called Mary Jump Cannon. She created a, 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 an indexing, a classification scheme, which today, even after more than 100 years later, people are actually using that. According to her, the most hottest surface temperature star, let us call it the O star, 
Next thought is the B star, then A star, F star, G star, K star, and M star. Right. Sun with a with the surface temperature of 5600 degrees centigrade is a very ordinary mundane type of star called G type of star. And not only that, as I mentioned, using the spectra also, they can be classified. Each of these spectra can have 22,000 and upwards absorption features. And it is a backbreaking job from, for an astronomer, astrophysicist to analyze the data and come out with all the chemical composition of the star, which also indicates the temperature at the surface, at the photosphere of the star, and also its different characteristics. And not only that, it is based on this classification, you can actually differentiate between stars of all size, all masses, all evolutionary process, even their process of birth and death. So it was a fantastic classification. That brings me to the life and death of stars. If some students are really interested into this, there are four basic equations, four differential equations, which can give you every details of the star. Equation of mass conservation, equation of hydrostatic equilibrium, the two balancing force of radiation pressure and gravity, as I mentioned in case of sun, energy transport due to radiation, from the core, how the energy is coming out towards the surface and energy generation mechanism. But the problem is that the, the boundary condition in case of a star, in case of sun is so critical, one really cannot solve it directly. So you have to use computer simulation codes or iterative methods to get a model of the sun or any star. And in terms of the properties of the material inside the sun, it, Without going into the details, it's called a polytropic equation where pressure as the last relation, pressure is some constant into density to the power one plus one by N. This N is something similar to do with that CP by CV, but not the same, and it is called the polytropic index. Stars are born from interstellar clouds of gas and dust. In the sky, there are regions where one can see these clouds and also star formation processes. My friend, I will just try to show you the absolute beauty of the cosmos some of these interstellar clouds. Just see for yourself, true color picture. And do you know what is the typical size of the cloud? 1000 solar system can be born out of this cloud. Don't mix it with the cloud in your sky because this is only the third planet from the sun and the atmosphere that we see the clouds. And from here, 1000 solar system will form. See for yourself. But you don't forget each of these pictures, 2.5 million pixels, each pixel will give you some in, in, information. For example, in the top, this greenish blue for oxygen five, oxygen six. This blue here is for neutral hydrogen. This is sulfur. This one is iron. This green is either zinc or molybdenum. And this white may be titanium. So analyzing these sort of photographs, it takes years after years of backbreaking effort. Because don't forget, as from a star, only the signal of light comes to us. You cannot bring down the star to your lab, cut it open, put chemical, test it, smell it, and say, ah, oh, oh, what it is. How difficult it is. Looking at a photograph of your fan or each other's photo on this video, you have to tell what is my surface temperature? What is my inside temperature? What is my mass? What is my chemical composition? How long ago you, I was born? It's almost impossible, isn't it? But don't forget, just looking at the light sent by the stars, you have to answer all these questions. So you have to be tremendously clever to do meaningful astrophysics. See this. It's, 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 it's an amazing thing. You see these three nodules over here. You know the size of each of these nodules. Each nodule inside is containing a fully formed solar system-like system. As if universe is throwing a challenge to our human intellect. You want to understand me, try to understand me. Huge things, but each dot, each point, giving us new information. See for yourself. It's, a, it's, it's, it's an amazing, it is really out of the world and in, from our perception point of view, out of the world. Three columns of dust moving very fast through the interstellar medium. The pressure that gets created at the tip is giving rise to stars every now and then, the birth of stars. Stellar nurseries. See for yourself. Million stars in a small region. Amazing. The color of the stars telling their evolutionary stage in their life, right? 
Now our time is short. If stars are born, they have to die. How do they die? Stars die different in different ways depending upon their initial masses. Let us talk about the stars whose initial mass is one to eight times the mass of sun. For example, take the sun. It is burning hydrogen to helium at the core. How long? How long the, there will be enough hydrogen at the core to, 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 to produce helium and to create the energy which ultimately supports our sun? If you do a small calculation, another 500 crore years. After 500 crore years, when all the hydrogen at the central core region gets transformed into helium, the thermonuclear fusion reaction stops, but the outward pressure stops, but gravity is there, so the star shrinks. As it shrinks in the outer envelope, there is still a lot of hydrogen remaining. And this outer envelope, as a because of constriction, as the temperature rises to 1.5 crore, the reaction that was happening at the core now happening, starts happening near the surface. Four hydrogen nuclei giving rise to a helium nucleus. Huge amount of energy is produced, heat is produced, the star being a gas or a plasma cloud expands. When it is expanding and expanding, in a small calculation you can show. Our sun after 500 crore years later will expand and the size will be such it will touch the orbit of Earth. It will be called a red giant. Mercury, Venus, Earth at least will cease to exist before that will go inside the sun. When the outside is becoming bigger, the inner central region, the core of helium, because of con constriction becomes more hot and temperature rises from 1.5 crore to 10 crore degree centigrade, which is enough for three helium nucleus to fuse together and produce a 12 carbon. Two helium giving, gives rise to a beryllium, a beryllium with a helium gives rise to carbon. And when this is, reaction is starts, again heat is produced, energy tries to come out, the central collapse stops. But by that time, the outer envelope has become so big, it starts becoming bigger and bigger and starts getting detached from the surface of the sun. This time it creates a cloud-like structure called planetary nebula. The word nebula means cloud. It is as if, as if in the formation stage of planets, it all happened from cloud. At the end stage of these stars, low mass stars, it is again creating the disk. And inside, the carbon ball becomes very hot because when all helium gets transformed to carbon, since the initial mass is small, it is not enough to produce more energy at that time, more heat to raise the temperature of two thousands of degrees centigrade. So only carbon is reached and it stops. But it's still very hot in the sky, like a dot, very bright dot. It will be seen as a white dwarf. Over millions of years, the outer planetary nebula will diffuse out into the atmosphere of this star. And the white dwarf, continuously giving away heat, will become cold and will either become a brown dwarf or a black dwarf. It will cease to exist. But some scientists have theoretically said that at that level, even on, on Earth, under tremendous amount of temperature and pressure, carbon gets transformed to diamond. And you can expect 10 to 12 kilometer piece of diamond floating in space. Prob one of the probable ways our sun will end its life. So this is actually the red giant and you see planetary nebula. Amazing. Almost 20, 25 years back since then, me and my small group, we have worked a little bit on the planetary nebula, especially the ejection of material as the circumstellar envelope or this outer envelope is becoming bigger and bigger. And this is actually the study called circumstellar envelopes of late type of stars where the, the pulsation we showed can produce huge amount of shock, which will move the shock front with a temperature of 50,000 degrees or so, but it will move so fast five to 10 times the speed of sound that just behind the shock front, molecules can form. Nobody believed this idea earlier, but when we do simulation, we could produce some molecules and amazingly, luckily, these molecules were actually observed at the end part of last century. People came to talk about in a huge number about this new vibrant subject called astrochemistry. And these are the molecules you predicted and have already been discovered. And it gives you an idea how organic material is produced by the star at its end phase. And these organic material are ultimately seeding the whole cosmos to make lives happen, even maybe for Earth. The death of stars, explosive kind, 
Stars whose initial mass is 8 to 25 times the mass of sun. In that case, initially hydrogen to helium at the core, when all hydrogen gets transformed to helium, contraction, contraction temperature rises, helium to carbon, again contraction, temperature rises, carbon to silic oxygen, silicon, sulfur, one after another elements get produced at the, at the core region. And ultimately it ends up into iron. Iron be, having the highest binding energy, howsoever pressure and temperature you give, the nuclei doesn't fuse. As a result, the inside of a star takes the shape of a peels of an onion. At the very central region, a ball of iron, and over that layer after layer, silicon, magnesium, neon, oxygen, carbon, helium. When this happens, the thermonuclear fusion reaction has stopped, but gravity takes over. All these layers with the tremendous force try to go towards the central region. The central iron ball has no head to go. It becomes incompressible. And the whole, all these layers gets a kick, a recoil. And as a result, the star as if implodes and spews out all this material. But at the point of implosion, the turbulence, the energy generation is so much in a fraction of a second, starting from iron in the periodic table, all the other elements, higher order elements gets produced. Since they're produced in a, in a fraction of a second, they cannot be produced in huge quantities. And on Earth, they have some name, rare earth element. So my friend, when you ask each atom of iron in your bloodstream, each atom of calcium in your bones, each atom of sodium, magnesium, whatever our body is made up of, where from it has come? The amazing answer today is that each atom, atom by atom, apart from hydrogen and helium, were produced inside the core of a star millions of years back. So my friend, it is not just a poetic statement. It is just an emotional appeal when I say that the out of this nuclear synthesis, which goes by the name the S process, right? And this tremendous explosion, we have come to the realization we are all star children. We are made up of star dust. And that is one of the biggest understanding of the link of life on earth and the surrounding and the cosmos and cosmic event. Now you know, apart, apart from the synthetic elements which can be which are produced synthetically on Earth, on the down below, there's part two things. Each and every atom element has been produced in a cosmic phenomenon. Hydrogen and helium mostly are the just after the Big Bang, when scientists believe the Earth was uh, the universe was produced, and all the other rest elements happened because of stellar nucleosynthesis. And in case of uh, a supernova, as it is called, if the mass that is left, left is between the 1.5 and 3 solar mass, it will not remain as a neutron star. That's the end product of a supernova. But it may collapse, right? If the, if the mass is bigger than that, it may collapse into a black hole, which I'll come maybe later if I have time. And this leftover object, it is so dense, every material gets transformed ultimately to a neutron. And the tremendous density, and with the spin, tremendous spin, it can create a collimated beam of light along the magnetic axis. And with the spin, this beam of light will create a cone in the sky. And if our line of observation cuts that cone, we get to see regular pulses, blip, blip, blip at very, very precisely regular interval, milliseconds, and those are called pulsars. So you see, the most accurate clock in the cosmos is not made by humans. It made in the cosmos itself, called pulsars. So my friend, in both of these cases, in case of a red giant, planetary nebula, white dwarf, and in case of a supernova explosion, you see, starting from a cloud of gas and dust ultimately synthesize materials to higher order of chemistry and gives, again, throws it back to the space. And the interstellar medium is an amazing object, is an amazing place where you have this tremendous amount of complex chemistry. And that has given birth to another concept. When the scientists ask, where from we have come? How did life happen on Earth? Now, progressively, more and more people are realizing, scientists are realizing, Earth 
never gave birth to life. The seeds of life, not life, the seeds of prebiotic life was bombarded onto earth by asteroids or meteorites or comets and they seeded the earth and from there using the proper atmosphere, the environment, the chemistry of the surface and water, life sprang up. So life came from space. This is called panspermia theory. And one of the challenging subject nowadays is astrobiology. 20 years back, nobody even used to think of the subject. But now astrobiology is very vibrant. I've almost come to the end of the stellar journey, but let me talk about that fantastic thing. Mysterious. Because scientists, long time back, more than 150, 125 years back, when they were discussing about stars, they were realized slowly that a star, if it is tremendously huge, and one after another, the, 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 the nuclear fusion reaction happens supporting the star, and the supernova happens. But if the star is huge and massive, more than 25 times the mass of sun initially, it may not explode, right? It will contract and contract and contract and ultimately become an infinitely dense point, maybe, or singularity in technical terms, in mathematical terms. And since the singularity doesn't have a physical existence in that sense, the gravitational pull will be enormous, right? Even light cannot escape from that. As if in, in, in the space-time, as if there is a hole where every material near the hole is falling onto it, and never to come back in our reality. Even light is not coming out, so it is dark or black, and we named it as black hole. But this concept of black hole got a definitive theoretical understanding, again, by the genius of Einstein. When he gave the general theory of relativity, the Einstein equation, g mu equal to kappa t mu, one of the most beautiful relation, I think, in our whole knowledge base. The left-hand side is all the curvatures that you see in the universe caused by all the mass and energy on the right hand side, T mu. And out of that, this concept slowly people started understanding that a heavy object creates a curvature in the space time. And if another object which doesn't have an enough energy to come out of the curvature, it has either to fall or with a standard velocity can go round. Similar is happening, Earth going around the sun. So in that case, if I have a tremendously heavy object, it will cause a curvature in space and time. And if it is a singularity with tremendous amount of density, mass, energy, you will see as if there is a hole that has been created on space time. And this concept slowly gave rise to the theoretical understanding of black holes. And around that region, around the neck region, if something's visualized, just this is visualization, it's not so simple. And something slides and falls within that color circle, it will never come back. And basically it is called the event horizon. And how you can see it? Because no light is coming. Because 66% of the stars in the sky are binary stars. If one star in the binary system becomes a black hole, because of its tremendous gravitational pull, it will attract the material from the other stars. And the material will not come and fall straight onto that black hole because it has to lose its angular momentum. So as it goes in a tremendous speed around and slowly spirals inward because of friction, huge amount of X-ray will be produced. And in a two collimated jet perpendicular to the disk of the, of the, of the accretion disk. And if you can see those collimated jets, you will understand there is a black hole. Or if you can see the disk also, the efficient disk, you'll understand that. So these are all simulations of how a black hole may appear in the sky. But nobody till today has given a clear cut picture of a black hole as we know in our stellar neighborhood. But for the last 30 years, tremendous amount of effort is going on. Thousand scientists trying very hard to understand and to observe and to take photograph of a black hole, but in this case, a supermassive black hole, because like a stellar mass black hole, we now believe every galaxy at its core has a huge supermassive black hole. Our galaxy Milky Way has a smaller, comparatively smaller, how small? 3.6 million solar mass. But there are galaxies 
huge galaxies, elliptical galaxies, who's at the central region through calculation, through the motions of other objects around it, they have come out with a number of billion solar mass. And this is a shot from the movie Interstellar, which told us how will the black hole look like? You see the accretion disk, but you see this top arch. This is actually a the part of the accretion disk on the back side. But because the space is so bent, because of a phenomena called gravitational lensing, you will see that you are seeing that as object as well. And lo and behold, just in your back, the shadow of darkness, the, the accretion disk region of a supermassive black hole in a distant corner of the universe called M87, a huge galaxy was found. So earlier, when people thought everything is imaginary, we used to perceive, but not only perception, now we actually can see, experience, and get to know about the workings of nature in its smallest level and it is at the grandest level. So astronomy, astrophysics, astrochemistry, astrobiology, astrostatistics, astrocomputing, each branch is telling us that the coming future is for astronomy and space science. Space science, not only just from the point of view of our atmosphere, 300, 400, 500 kilometers above the Earth's surface, but space science in the, in the context of the deepest part of the space and time, the cosmos. So my friend, with the advent of technology in the last two, three decades, huge amount of things have happened in our knowledge. So what you have realized that these technologies has opened up a window in our mind. And through that window, the picture, the color, the diversity, the understanding of the universe is telling us we have only started in a small region of space called Earth. And as we are going out, every moment, every day, every year, every person involved in it will try to get a much more clearer picture of nature. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk to you. I hope I could give you a glimpse of the beauty of the cosmos. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. What a colorful and beautiful voyage it has been. Thank you. And what is the presentation? Oh my God. Uh, so there are a lot of questions, but we are really uh, uh, short of time. Uh, if sir allows, we maybe take uh, two or three questions. Yes, yeah, definitely, definitely. So the first question is why the temperature of the corona layer of sun shows such anomalies? Good, very good question. The surface temperature, I told you 5,600, whereas in corona, instead of the temperature going down, the temperature reaches 2 to 3 lakh million degrees centigrade. And according to the understanding, it is those spicules from the chromospherical region, the spicules, spikes of gas, carries the magnetic energy of the sun and deposits that energy 100,000 kilometers away in a region which you call corona, thereby heating up the coronal temperature. Next question, please. So, Is there a black hole exist at the center of spiral galaxy? Yes. Now, more or less, there is a school of thought which is becoming more powerful nowadays that any, any galaxy at the central region will have a black hole. Some quiescent, meaning sleeping, some very active. Though in, in case of spiral, as well as in case of elliptical. So what is called wormhole? Ah, wormhole is a mathematical construction. If black hole is a, sort of as if swallowing everything, where does the things go? So scientists has come out with con this concept in a very generalized manner. I'm not going to the depth of it. Right, that at some point in the universe you can see spontaneous emission of energy. And those are actually the other end of a black hole as if connected by a sort of a neck-like region called Einstein-Rosen bridge. Any material through that will pass with a velocity much faster than the velocity of light as we have described about tachyons. So these are the wormholes in some sense, very simplistic sense. 
So next, the detailed question: Do the proportions of gases, ions, and molecules change in a nebula, and can this change of proportion affect the shape of nebula, like horse nebula? The shape of a nebula is much more because of its environment, because nearby there is a star. So the star is not only emitting light; it is producing pressure on the on the on, on the nebula. So that will sculpt. Suppose something has exploded, it will create a shell like a bubble. You will see, but definitely the chemistry and the temperature it definitely plays a role in the overall approach or overall look of the thing, overall physics and chemistry of this interstellar medium. But the shape depends on the type of environment that nebula is in. So the next question is: Why do we say that? Uh, neutrinos carry most of the energy in a supernova explosion see these are uh, still debatable because there are something called cosmic rays which we call cosmic rays very very highly energetic particles which are come out at the production of during a supernova and it can cross not only star stellar regions it can cross from one galaxy pass to the intergalactic medium reach the other galaxy and pass through it also sometimes on earth we get to see this one or two of these cosmic rays out of millions if the heat a uh, nucleus there will be a cosmic ray shower so neutrinos do take part in this energy carrying out of energy but so does cosmic rays and other materials as well and one inquisitive question is death of heavy massive stars related to birth of black hole death of a massive star if you call the death by supernova by supernova explosion then if the remnant neutron star is of a bigger than a certain critical mass it becomes a black hole or if the the, the star itself in on its own is huge massive then its end product or death you can say in some sense can be a result re resulting in a black hole So almost uh, one and a half hour, uh, Professor Duwari is being restless in <laughs> during lectures. So thank on behalf much. of the organizing committee, we thank Sir Juan again for thank you, thank your you. invitation thank and good five for now. Thank you very much, Sir. Thank you. Thank you. So what do you do, Professor Shorkar? Hope all the present participants enjoyed the lecture. thanks again dr dev prasad duwari for your lecture on a topic a cosmic voice it was nice and interesting presentation and thanks dr devoto bhadro to host this session uh, once again reminding to all participants uh, feedback form will be sent to you mail uh, after validated session we had already sent a mail to all participants containing bgc library link yesterday night register yourself first to download participation certificate of this conference after filling up feedback form and a different link will be sent to the paper presenters for downloading presentation certificates by tomorrow every participants and paper presenter must attend validatory session we will announce the winners of oral presentation there will be two winners each for physics and bioscience presenter and one winner for chemistry now this session is over after break we will have technical session 2 for oral presentation bioscience presentation from sharp 2 pm and they have remaining paper presenter of yesterday oral presentation and physics and chemistry from 3 pm thank you very much